And we are live. Let's see who's going to be first to join. We were a little bit late starting today. We were a little bit late starting. <laughs> Let's see who's going to be first to join. Who's it going to be today? Who's it going to be today? Hello, Layla. Okay, looking at the chat. Hello, Jacob. Hello, guys. Let me know in the chat. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah, everybody's here. It's Janaz here. YT is here. Wolfa is, is here. Robin is here. Ayush is here. Layla's here. Step is here. Guys, how are we doing? Sorry, I was a little bit late getting on. Sorry, I was a little bit late getting on. We're normally always on time at five o'clock. Um, but uh, yeah, today I had to do some last minute uh, fixing of the tripod. It, it didn't decided not to work on me. So I uh, got that sorted and uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're good to go now. We're good to go now. For those of you wondering, today is going to be an AQA higher paper. We're going to be doing the November 2018 paper two. So the AQA November 2018 paper two is what we're going to be doing today. Um, we're going to start a little bit later. Normally we start at 10 past, but I didn't actually start the live until like five, six past. So we'll give it a little bit more time today. Hey, Sidemen is in the house. Hello, mate. Hello. How are you doing? Bellingham is here. Love to see it. Danny says half term revision. Get me in with it. Come on. Uh, Simon said, how long have you been live? I literally just got on. I literally just got on. We normally start at five past on the dot. Today, we were a little bit delayed. We were a little bit delayed. Um, Shab is here. Welcome, mate. Welcome. How are you doing? Guys, by the way, let me know. Uh, let me know in the chat. Is the audio clear today? Rene is here. Hey, awesome, awesome. Amy says, hello. Normal says, yes, sir. Awesome, awesome. We've got a lot of the regulars today. This is great to see. Ellie's here. Awesome. Okay, good to hear, Sideman. Good to hear. Fatty Meister says, crystal clear. Come on. Amy says, audio is good. Guys, how are we doing? How's today been? Have you been revising? Have you been chilling out? I'm sure there'll be a bit of a mixture. Um, but yeah, for those of you wondering, this evening is going to be an AQA higher paper. AQA higher paper. We're going to be doing the November 2018 paper two. Enha says it's been revising today. Yeah. Hey, no worries, V. For those of you who don't know, by the way, we switch between edXL and AQA. We normally do um, three higher papers and then a foundation paper, but it switches up a little bit. If you want the specific details, you can have a look on the IG. Pin to the top there, you'll see the live stream schedule until the end of the uh, your GCSE maths exams, because I'm going to be going live every day until the end of your GCSE maths. Shadow says, I'll be back in five minutes. Hey, no worries, mate. No worries. Guys, we're going to start at quarter past today. I've decided we're going to start at quarter past. Um, let's have a look. For those of you wondering, because I know some of you will have joined since I last said it, today is going to be the AQA November 2018 paper two higher tier. Uh, good question, actually. Good question. Um, Apple user said, Sir, should I only be revising? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You don't want to spend all of your time over half term revising. Do you want to revise? Definitely. Do you want to try and play in a good few hours a day if possible? Definitely. Do you want to spend all of your time revising? Definitely, definitely not. If you do that, you're going to get way too tired. You're not going to be productive during the time you actually spend revising. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I would recommend kind of if possible up to three hours maybe four hours at a push, but definitely not all the time. Definitely not all the time. You're going to get way too tired and you're going to get so bored of it. So yeah, no worries, Apple user. My, uh, my biggest piece of advice would be make sure you're exercising every day. Make sure you're getting your sleep in, trying to sleep at least eight hours. That would be my biggest advice alongside the revision. It's going to be really important over this week, especially those of you who normally do sports and normally maybe exercise, go to the gym, but stopped because of exams. Pick that back up over half term. Make sure you pick that back up. Lil says what paper? AQA, November 2018, paper two, higher tier today, higher tier today. Do you have predicted topics posted? Nope, but a lot of you have been asking for it. It will be uploaded tomorrow. It will be uploaded tomorrow. Cherry is in the house. Love to see it. Love to see it. Welcome, Cherry. Let's have a look. Can any topics come up in paper two? To be honest, yeah. To be honest, yeah. Um, you'll see that my predicted topics, it's not predicted, it's a hot topics. Um, and there's going to be 30 on there. There's going to be 30 on there because 
To be honest, going into paper two, you really can't narrow it down that much. Karima is here. Welcome back, Karima. Hey, we've got a lot of the regulars today. This is awesome. This is awesome. I'm good. Thank you, Imno. Meg says, how many days should you revise a subject per week? That's a great question as well. That's a great question as well. Um, different people have different opinions on this. I personally like to do one subject per day and that's going to split a lot of opinions. Um, but I like to like really get into one subject on each day and kind of revise them less frequently, but in more depth. Some people like to do like three or four subjects a day. So completely opinion based, completely opinion based. Okay, a couple more minutes and we will get going, guys. A couple more minutes and we will get going. Um, <laughs> yeah, the smart water, that is a complete, complete coincidence. A lot of people pick up on the smart water. Yeah, <laughs> complete coincidence. Just my uh, my local shop, that's what they sell. Zane says, yo, good to have you, Alvarez. Man like Gundo is in the house. Awesome, Ibrahim is back as well. We love to see it, okay? The regulars are here. Saying what we're doing today is going to be an AQA higher paper. AQA higher paper. Okay. Adiat says what topics are coming up on edXL higher. Nobody can predict accurately. And anybody who's claiming to be predicting accurately, pff, complete BS, to be honest. That to me is a red flag. That would be a major red flag. If anybody is saying specifically, okay, these five topics are definitely going to come up. Um, bit of a red flag. Nobody can predict accurately. My list, like I say, has 30 topics. Are they guaranteed to come up? Nope. Are they the only topics which can come up? Definitely not. Do I think they're quite likely? Yeah, I do. That's what I would say to that. Okay, one more minute and we will get into it. Hello, Amelia, how are you doing? Karima says, um, which paper is it today? It is the uh, AQA, November 2018, paper two. That's what it's going to be. Yeah, that's true. Somebody said, yeah, somebody predicting uh, GCSE papers is the ick. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's that's the way it should be, to be honest. You're doing it right if that's how you're feeling. Um, you're doing it right if that's how you're feeling. Okay, looking at the chat, guys. Any questions, let me know. Any last minute ones? We are about to get going. Joe said, can the same topics on paper one come up on paper two? Technically, they can, you know. Technically, they can. They are very unlikely, I would say. The specific testing kind of the exact same ideas, very unlikely, but it's possible. Um, Cobra said, are you South African? Um, no, I'm not actually. I get that quite a lot. A lot of people like ask about my accent, think it's South Africa or something. No, I'm fully British actually. Um, and also thank you to the moderators. I can see that a lot of you are here again today. Um, so. To those of you who are new, make sure you don't spam the chat. Can you comment the answer? Definitely. Can you ask questions? Please do. Please ask all the questions in the world. But if you have something that you really want me to hear, don't just copy and paste it and spam it in the chat. You will get muted very quickly. So uh, yeah, don't do that, please. Zeds is in the house. Love to see it. Um, let's have a look. Meg says is studying um, maths every Thursday and Saturday enough. To be honest, I would say it depends how you feel. Some people will be feeling really good with their maths and they won't want to revise it as much as, for example, science. Some people will be feeling really shaky on maths and they'll want to do it every day, right? So uh, it kind of depends on how you're feeling with it. Okay, looking at the chat, guys. Any last minute questions before we get into it? Let's have a look. Um... Yeah, thank you, Famalam, because November 2018, paper two, AQA, hi, I love to see it. Somebody said, is summer going to be good? Hey, your guy's summer is going to be ridiculous. Your guy's summer is going to be the best summer you've ever had for most of you. That's for sure, for sure. I've just spotted the time. It is 16 minutes past. So, guys, I'm going to flip the camera around and we will get into it. Flipping the camera now. Just give me a second. The tripod was being a little bit dodgy before we got live. So hopefully it's going to hold up for us. Let's have a look. Flip camera. There we go. Tripod is in place. Let me know, guys. Can you see this? Is it clear? We have the AQA November 2018 paper two higher tier. Looking at the chat now. Can you guys see it? Rene says clear. 
Karima says clear. Kira says perfect. Angela or Angela says yeah. Anna says it's very clear. Okay, guys, come on. That means it is time for us to get going with this paper. So for those of you who are new or whose first time it is, the format is basically that I will give you guys a little bit of time to answer each of the questions and then I will explain the answers. If it's a one mark question, I won't give you too long. Um, the more marks, the more time I will give you. Lil said, how do I find the paper? Great question. You can find it on my website, mygcscmaths.com. There's a bunch of videos on there. Um, there's a bunch of question sheets and you can also find all of the papers super clearly laid out. So uh, yeah, you can find it on there. Okay. Here we have questions one, two, and three on the screen. Let's see what we can do. Can we bag three for three at the start? Robin says, ready. Anybody else ready? Let's have a look. This one, question one, isn't going to take much time at all. So let's talk about it. It says, what does A and then this sign here B represent? In probability of A, this sign B, circle your answer. What do we think, guys? What's it going to be? It's going to be A and B. It's going to be A and B. How do we remember that? Because this comes up quite a lot. We have this sign here. This means and, and we have this sign here. This means or. How do we remember that this means and? Well, I like to think that it's shaped like an N. And if you say and really quickly, it's like, yeah, A and B. What does it represent? A and B. And we can see here it's like A and B. Un is just short for and. So that is a nice way of remembering that one. The other sign is this U shape, which is shaped like a bucket. For example, A or B. The way that we remember that this is or is that it's like a bucket. It fills everything in. So you can have A or you can have B. Okay, question two. Let me know in the chat when you guys are ready. Angela says or Angela says intersection. Yep, yeah, you can definitely say it as intersection. And you, you can definitely call it union. They are technically the names, but it's a bit easier to understand if you just kind of say it how I did. Karima says, yup. What do we reckon to this next one, guys? Have you been watching the TikToks? If you have, then, you know, I think you should get this one. Question two says, P is the point four nine and Q is the point negative two one. Circle the midpoint of PQ. How are we going to find the point which is exactly halfway between these two points? What we're going to do is we're going to add the coordinates together and then halve the result. So to get the X coordinate, we're going to firstly add together our two X coordinates, four and negative two. Four plus minus two is going to give us two. And with our y coordinates, we do nine plus one to get 10. We add those coordinates together. And then what do we have to do? We have to halve them. Half of two is one. Half of 10 is five. So we can write it then as one five. That gives us our answer, one five. To find the midpoint of two points, guys, we can add the points together or the coordinates together, I should say, the x to the x and the y to the y, and then half it. Okay, question three on the screen. Let me know when you guys are ready. You probably haven't had a chance to read it yet, so I'll give you a bit of time now. Yep, this is a higher paper to anybody wondering. It's the AQA, November 2018, higher tier paper two. Okay, Beatrice thinks it's bottom right. What do we think? Anybody else? Somebody, unfortunately, I can't read Arabic, says bottom left. Somebody thinks it's this one. Luckman thinks it's 149.16.25. Okay, bottom left as well. Guys, what do we think? It is going to be this one down here, our sequence 139.27.81. Now, why is it going to be this one? It's going to be this one because... A geometric progression is a sequence where to get from one term to the next term, 
we have to multiply by a constant. We have to multiply by the same number each time. We can see that for this sequence here, to get from one term to the next, we multiply by three. To get from one to three, we times it by three. To get from three to nine, we times it by three. And finally, to get from nine to 27 and 27 to 81, again, we times by three. So guys, that one there is gonna be our geometric progression. Aishan said there's a common ratio. That is exactly right. And the common ratio for this one is three. Next question, guys. Ah, uh, this is a nasty one, I would say. Question four, this is a nasty one for a one marker. The bearing of A from B is 310 degrees. Circle the bearing of B from A. Nicely done, Sidemen. Says three out of three. Good job, mate. Good job. Okay, Nissa, great question. Said, what is a quadratic sequence? A quadratic sequence is where? there is an increasing difference, or sorry, there is a changing difference from one term to the next, but the difference is changing at a constant rate. A lot of you are thinking that this answer is 50. You are actually not correct, so give it another think. This is a tricky question. This is a tricky question. Somebody's dropping 130 in the chat. Let's have a look. Charlie Hughes thinks it's 130. We've got a 110. There are some split opinions here. Let me help you guys out and draw a diagram. Let's see what we're looking, dealing with here. It says the bearing of A from B is 310 degrees. Circle the bearing of B from A. Let's draw a little diagram. The bearing of A from B is 310 degrees. Remember, we measure our bearings from the north line. So let's say that this is the point B. This is the north line. If the bearing of A from B is 310 degrees, A is going to be somewhere up here. And why is that? That's because this angle here has to be 310 degrees. This would be 90, this would be 180, this would be 270. So we know it's gonna be further than three quarters of the way around. We can come up here, draw another north line. Now, what is the angle that we're interested in? Or what is the bearing that we're interested in? We're interested in the bearing of B from A, which is gonna be this angle here this angle here. This is the bearing of B from A because this is the angle at which we have to travel on starting at the north line. How do we do that? Well, what are we going to do? We're going to firstly use the fact that this has to be 50 degrees. This is 50 degrees because angles around a point add up to 360 degrees. And then we're going to use our facts about parallel lines. With respect to the two parallel north lines, these two angles here are co-interior. That means they add to 180 degrees. That means that this angle here has to be 180 subtract 50, which is 130 degrees, giving us our bearing of 130, our answer to question four. Guys, that was a brutal one mark question, a brutal one mark question, but hopefully that made sense after I explained it. Quite a few steps in there. A little bit mean for a one marker, but hopefully that is clear now. Let me know if you have any questions in the chat. Nissi says that makes sense now. Fantastic. That sounds like progress. Izzy said I would have guessed 130. Lol. Yep, you would be laughing if you guessed 130 because, yeah, <laughs> you, would have, uh, you would have smashed it with none of the effort. So it would have been a good guess. Okay, let's have a look then. Question five. There haven't been any questions about that previous one. What do we have here? It says a circle has a circumference C and a diameter D. It then says C equals K times by D. What value does the constant D represent? Muller says pi. Jamie Dillon says pi. Star says pi. And you guys are correct. It represents pi. Why is that? That's because we know that to calculate our circumference of a circle, we use the fact that the circumference is equal to pi times by the diameter. And this is actually in our formula book this year. Circumference is equal to pi times diameter. Down here, they say that circumference is equal to k times diameter. So what does k have to be? k has to be pi. A little bit of a weird question, that one as well. Hopefully that made sense. Let's move on to the next question. If you have any questions about that last one, you can let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them all. Ah, Sidemen said, if you wrote pi in words, would you get it? Yes, you would. Yes, you would. That would be completely fine. 
And also, out of in, or just so you know, to spell pi in the maths way, it's just P-I. It's just P-I. A lot of people think it's spelled like pie as in like pie that you eat, like apple pie or something. But it's actually just P-I. If you spelt it like pie, apple pie, that would also be completely fine. You would still get the mark. Nah, they, they should be good. If you had like a really, it would take a really annoying examiner, a really, really annoying examiner to care about that. But yeah, in, uh, if you check the mark scheme, it, it would, it doesn't actually, it w or it wouldn't say, um, but it would be fine. It would be fine. You could write P-I-E. Okay, guys, this is a very common type of question in paper two. Very common type of question in paper two. It says, here is some information about 20 trains leaving a station. We have the number of minutes late that the trains are. In groups, we have the number of trains in each of the groups, a column for midpoint, another column, and then it says work out an estimate of the mean number of minutes late. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. When you guys are ready, you know the drill, drop ready in the chat. And once quite a few people have said it, um, we can start to go through it. Charlie likes this one. Stepper says ready. Breeze ready. Karima is ready. Alina is ready. Enha is ready. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. What are we going to do here? Well, here we have the mean from a grouped frequency table. Now, how are we gonna find the mean from a grouped frequency table? This question is quite generous because it already tells us that we need to find our midpoint and that we need to find something else as well. So let's go ahead and find our midpoint of the groups and work from there. Finding the midpoint of zero and five, you could either do it in your head, 2.5, or you could do five plus zero, which is five, and then divide it by two. Likewise, with this one, you could do it in your head, halfway between five and 10, 7.5, or you could add those two together, get 15, divide it by two. Finally, halfway between 10 and 15, we're gonna have 12.5. You could do it in your head or add them together and divide by two. Down here, we actually aren't gonna be able to find a midpoint because this just says that T is greater than or equal to 15. So we can't find a midpoint there. It's okay though, we're not gonna need to because this is a quantity of zero. So this will just be zero anyway. Next step, we're going to do our number of trains times by our midpoint and fill in that column there. So we're going to do 12 times by 2.5, which is going to be 30. We're going to do seven times by 7.5, which is going to give us 52.5 going in here. And then we're going to do one times by 12.5 to get 12.5 in this box here. Next step, guys, what's it gonna be? Well, to find our, mid, our mean, sorry, we need to do our total quantity divided by our total frequency. So the total number of minutes, which is gonna be the total of this column here, divided by our total number of trains. Now, we were told already that the total number of trains is 20, so we could have added those together, but we wouldn't need to because it says 20 in the question. And then we're going to add these together. 30 plus 52.5 plus 12.5 is going to be 95. Final step then is going to do our total, is going to be, sorry, to do our total number of minutes, 95 divided by our total frequency of 20. Typing that into our calculator, 95 divided by 20. We're going to get 4.75. Now, some of you might be thinking, can I just write 95 over 20? Yes, you would still get the marks. That would be completely fine. It doesn't say to give it as a decimal. It doesn't say to give it in its simplest form. So if you just wrote that 95 over 20 in here, you would get all of the marks. That would be fine. Okay, next question down here, 6b. I'll give you guys a chance to read this. Let me just write the mean from the previous one. And I will look at the chat now and answer any questions about that previous one. Hey, cool face, my pleasure, my pleasure. I'm great to, uh, or it's great, I should say, to hear that it's helping. Okay, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do that because it would take a lot, a lot of time. Um, and there's so many different topics, right? But I'm sure somebody will have already done that on the internet. So if, uh, yeah, if you if you search for um, topic lists for GCSE Maths past papers, I'm sure they'll come up. Uh, Robin said, would it be okay if I take a screenshot of the previous question? Yep, definitely. I'll go up in just a second after this 
and um, and you can take a screenshot. This one is another question which requires us to find a mean. Let's have a look. It says the station manager looks at the information in more detail. We have new boundaries and new numbers of trains. It says he works out an estimate of the mean using this information. How does his estimate compare with the answer to part A? Tick one box. Now, this is a little bit cheeky in my opinion because we literally have to do the exact same thing again, but now we only get one mark, whereas before we got three marks. But let's give it a go and see what we get. Here we have the group being zero to two. Midpoint is gonna be one. Let me write that in there. And then we're gonna do one times by 12 gives us 12. We have a zero here, so that's just gonna be zero, zero and zero. Here we have a midpoint between four and six of five. And then five times by seven is 35. Down here we have a midpoint of 11. 11 times by one is 11. Now we can add these together. 12 plus 35 plus 11. You can do that in your head or on your calculator. It's gonna be 58. And our, um, sample size or our number of trains I should say is still 20. So this time we have 58 over 20. We could type that into our calculator, 58 over 20. And we would see that it's 2.9. The mean was 4.75. The mean is now 2.9. So we can see that it's lower than in part A. You could do that a little bit quicker through inspection, but this method is definitely gonna be the clearest for most people. Nicely done, Sidemen, good job. Luckman said, where did you get the 20 from? We added together the number of trains. So same as in the previous one. I'm just gonna put this on the screen so you guys can screenshot if you would like. Giving you five seconds. I know I moved pretty quickly through that one. So if you guys have any questions, let me know, let me know. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's get cracking, guys. Next question, no worries at all, Robin, no worries at all. Another fairly long question. We've got a four marker here. You can definitely pick up a few marks here, even if you're not sure what the question actually wants you to do, because this is a pretty tricky one, especially for quite early on in the paper. Even if you're not sure what the question wants you to do, you could get a few marks on this. Hey, Sideman says, love the music on the Instagram posts. Come on, I uh, I was getting so like frustrated with the music here, um, or the music I was having to use for the posts on, on this. Now I've found a way to get better music on TikTok. Um, but, uh, but yeah, hopefully we had some better music on the Insta posts because um, I was getting frustrated with the dodgy, with the dodgy music on here. But yeah, we managed to get some Afro bash going on. So I was happy, I was happy. I don't know, 250061 says you can expand it. My friend, you are correct. You can definitely pick up a couple of marks from expanding this. And then what are we gonna do? Compare coefficients, you say, and you are correct. You are correct. I'm like Bellingham's in the chat. Love to see it, mate. Hope you've had a good one today. Let me know in the chat when you're ready for me to go through this, guys, and I can go through it, and I can go through it. Are we ready? Izzy said, what is a coefficient? Always confuses me. Yeah, this is annoying, the coefficient stuff. Yeah. Okay, Antonio's ready. Angela's ready. I'll talk you through it now, Izzy. I'll talk you through it now. Okay, let's have a look. It says, work out the values of A and B in the identity. Um, five times by seven X plus eight plus three times by two X plus B is equivalent to AX plus 13. Now, this equivalent sign will have tripped a few people up and confused you. But for the sake of this, you can just treat it like an equals. What we're going to do, guys, is we're going to expand this bracket and expand this bracket and then compare what we have on the left-hand side to what we have on the right-hand side. That's going to allow us to work out the values of A and B. Let's have a look. Expanding these brackets on the right hand on the left hand side. Ooh, <laughs> expanding these brackets on the left hand side, we have five times by seven x, which is thirty five x, and then we have five times by eight, which is forty. We then have three times by two x, that's going to be six x, and then three times by b, that's going to be three b, and that is equivalent to a x plus thirteen. 
We can now, comp uh, sorry, we can now collect our like terms on this side of the equation. 35x plus 6x, that's going to be 41x. And then we have plus 40 plus 3b. This again is equivalent to ax plus 13. And this is the part where we're going to compare our coefficients. Now, what do we mean by compare coefficients? We can see that on the left-hand side, we have one term in x. Let me get a green one, actually. We have one term in x, and on the right-hand side, we have one term in x. And on the left-hand side, away from the x with nothing next to it, we have 40 plus 3b, and on the right-hand side, we have 13. What that tells us, then, is that our 41 has to be equal to our a because they're doing the same job. They're both with the x. That gives us the value of a, 41. And then we can do 40 plus 3b as being equal to 13. Whereas with the a, we just got our answer straight away as a being 41. With the b, we're going to have to do a little bit more legwork. We have to rearrange this equation to make b the subject. We can subtract 40 from both sides. We get 3b equals 13 minus 40, that's minus 27. You can definitely use a calculator for that if you get, uh, or if you struggle a bit with positives and negatives. We can then divide both sides by three. We get B equals minus nine. So guys, we get our answer. A equals 41 and B equals minus nine. Talk to me in the chat. What did we think of that? Veds, nicely done. Stepper, nicely done. Top work. Hey, Gecko is in the chat. Welcome back. Good to have you. Good to have you. Okay. Um, Naeem says good. Yeah, good, Izzy. That is the sound of progress. That is the sound of progress. Great to hear. Simon got A but not B. Hey, that's good, mate. If you got A but not B, you probably would have got three marks out of the four. So nicely done. Hopefully it makes sense, though, how we would get the B. It's a little bit trickier. Definitely harder to spot, but hopefully it makes sense now. Katie says so much better. Yeah, come on, V says, this is this was confusing, but now crystal clear. Hey, guys, that is the best, best thing I can hear in the chat. That's great to hear. Okay, giving you guys five seconds to screenshot now, if you'd like to screenshot this, and then we'll move on to the next question, and I can answer any particular questions that you guys have. Okay, um, when I go on to the next one, feel free to ask any questions, and I can answer them for you. Three, two, one, let's go. Question eight, another four marker. This paper, guys, is full of four markers. But again, I think this one is not too bad. Um, well, actually, the last one was pretty bad. This one, I think, is a bit nicer. Don't get me wrong. It's not an easy question. That's for sure, for sure. But we can pick up some marks here. Okay, okay. You guys aren't agreeing. Bree's not a fan of these ones. Zane says, sussy question. Jamie Dillon says, not this type of question. Okay, the people have spoken. The people have spoken. I got a bit carried away. Not a nice question. However, once I explain this, guys, it will make sense. So if you're struggling a bit with this or don't, okay, Hafsa says worse questions. Somebody said Brazy. Okay, most people aren't liking these. Most people aren't liking these. But give it a go, guys. And make sure when I explain it that you listen carefully and hopefully it will all become clear. Hopefully it will all become clear. Sidemen says, don't know where to start. Okay, for those of you who don't know where to start, let me give you a quick hint. Let me give you a quick hint. The question says, two identical quarter circles are cut from a rectangle as shown. Work out the shaded area. Work out the shaded area. How can we work out the shaded area? Well, the shaded area is going to be equal to the area of this total rectangle. Subtract the areas of these two quarter circles. When it comes to working out the area of the total rectangle, we're going to need the width of the base. How can we work that out? Well, we know that this whole thing is 12 centimeters, and it's cut in half by these quarter circles. That tells us that this is 6 centimeters, and this is 6 centimeters. If this is 6 centimeters, a radius of our quarter circle, then this must also be six centimeters. Hopefully that pushes you guys in the right direction if you were struggling to get into it before. It's definitely still not an easy question. However, hopefully that will have kind of pushed a couple of you guys along the line into, into being able to get started with it. Uh, that is correct, Kay. That is correct. 
Okay, better than I expected, says Hafsa. Nice. Giving you guys another minute or so, and then I will talk through it. Yeah, and actually, guys, let me just say, let me just say, the exam boards at Excel and AQA in recent years have done a lot of this type of question where they don't actually tell you that something is being split in half by two shapes but it is kind of showing on the diagram that it's split in half by two shapes. Those of you who have been on a lot of the live streams um, might remember, actually, it's going to be too specific, but might recognize this type of thing going on where the shape is split in half by two smaller shapes. This, uh, this, this type of thing does come up a lot. Okay, let's talk about it. I've given you guys a while now. Work out the shaded area. We're going to work out the area of the rectangle. and we're gonna subtract the area of the quarter circles. Area of our rectangle, we have a height of 12 and a width of six. So it's going to be 12 times by six, which is 72. You could use your calculator or do that in your head. Either way is completely fine. And then we need to work out the area of these quarter circles. How are we gonna do that? Well, we know that the area of a circle is equal to pi r squared. The area of a circle is equal to pi r squared, but we don't have a circle. Up here, what do we have? We have a quarter of a circle. So we're going to need to do a quarter of pi r squared to get the area of one of our circles, or quarter circles, I should say. So we do a quarter times by pi times by our radius squared. Our radius is six, so we have six squared. What's this gonna be? We have um, six times by six is 36. 36 over four is going to be nine. So we can write this as nine pi. Definitely guys, you can do that on your calculator. So we know that the area of this is nine pi. If the area of this quarter circle is nine pi, then the area of this quarter circle also has to be nine pi. So to calculate the overall shaded area, we have the area of our rectangle, which is, let me just change color now to make this clear, 72. And we're gonna take away the area of each of our quarter circles. So minus nine pi, minus nine pi. We can bring together our minus nine pi and minus nine pi, we get minus 18 pi. So we get 72 subtract 18 pi as our final answer. I know a few of you guys are gonna ask, do you have to leave it in this form? No, you don't. You can write it as a decimal. It's going to be roughly 15.45, round about there. A couple of you are saying, couldn't we have just subtracted the area of a semicircle because this and this together are a semicircle? That is correct. You could also have done that. That would also be completely fine. A giveaway is going to be that if you guys got this answer, then you definitely did a, a, an appropriate method. Okay, Luckman said, like question, voila. Yeah, nice. Okay, Izzy said that was a nice one. Okay, yeah, see, this is one of the things, guys. Questions like this, when you see it, oh, so annoying. You turn over the page, you're like, oh, God, here we go. How am I going to do this? Um, but once you've seen how it's done, hopefully it's a little bit clearer. Hopefully it's a little bit clearer. Yeah, Jamie Dillon says nicer than it seems. Hey, Sideman, what do you think of that one? Did that make sense uh, after I explained it or is it still a bit tricky? We have another four marker on the screen here, guys. I'm gonna look at the chat now. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll answer as many as possible. Sarah said, do you do Edexcel? Yep, we switch between AQA and Edexcel. <laughs> this is another one which you guys aren't gonna like. This is another one which you guys probably aren't gonna to like too much. Uh, N said, can I screenshot the previous? Yeah, you can. Guys, I'm just gonna go back for five seconds so people can screenshot. Five, four, three, two, one. Next question. Let's go. Let's go. Four marker. All of the information is on there. And um, yeah, again, I'll give you guys a hint with this once you've had a little bit of time. Ah, see, that's actually interesting. So you said, I get it. But if you gave me that question on my own, I wouldn't know how to do it. I know a lot of people are going to be feeling like that. A lot of people are going to be feeling like that. And let me tell you, that is exactly why we're doing what we're doing. Because before this session, that is what would have happened. You would have seen it. 
and you would have not known what to do without being shown how to do it. However, now that you've seen that one, next time you come across a question like that, you're gonna probably know what to do or you're at least gonna have more of an idea. So it's completely natural to feel like that, completely natural, and I know a lot of people do feel like that. But like I say, that is exactly why we're doing this so we can overcome that little barrier. Okay, guys, let me know. Are you ready for me to go through this? Would you like a hint? This one's a little bit annoying, I would say. Drop either hint or ready in the chat and we can go through it. Okay, a couple of people are ready. Okay, most people, yeah, okay guys, let's talk about it, let's talk about it. Quite a few people are saying ready. This one will have tripped a lot of people up, 180 of us right now. Don't be biased by the people in the chat who get it right. That's only like five or 10 out of 180. Not many people would get this in the exam. Let's have a look, guys. The diagram shows the position of a tap when off and fully on. The tap is fully on when the angle of turn is 180 degrees. When fully on, water flows out of the tap at 14 liters per minute. The rate at which the water flows out is in direct proportion to the angle of turn. The tap is turned 135 degrees. The water flows into a tank with a capacity of 79.8 liters. Will it take less than seven and a half minutes to fill the tank? You must show your working. So guys, we're gonna have to work out how long it takes to fill the tank and see whether that is more or less than seven and a half. How are we gonna do it? Well, we know that if the tap was fully on, it would flow at 14 liters per minute. However, the tap is not fully on. What proportion of on is the tap? Well, it's 135 degrees out of 180 degrees turned. So the rate of flow is 135 out of 180 degrees of what it would be if it was fully turned. So we have turned it 135 out of 180 degrees. So the rate of flow is gonna be 135 out of 180 degrees times by what it would be at the max, which is 14. So we can work out our rate of flow by doing 135 over 180 times by 14. Let's do that now. 135 divided by 180 times by 14. If we do that, guys, we get 10.5. We get 10.5. So we know that the rate of flow is 10.5 liters per minute. Now we're gonna go from having the liters per minute to working out the number of minutes it takes while well, it has a capacity of 79.8. So if it's flowing 10.5 every second, sorry, every minute, every minute, we're gonna have to do 79.8 divided by 10.5 to work out our number of minutes that it's going to take. If we do 79.8 divided by 10.5, what do we get? We get 7.6. We get 7.6, so it's going to take 7.6 minutes to fill. Therefore, will it take less than seven and a half minutes? No, it won't. It will take more. Why? Because 7.6 is more than seven and a half. Guys, let me know in the chat. Did that make sense when I went through it? I'm sure a few of you are going to have questions about that one. That was a pretty tricky question. Okay, Marina didn't mind it too much. Okay, looking, looking. Okay, it looks like we didn't mind that one too much. Ah, that would be completely fine, Jamie Dillon. That would be another method. If some of you worked out how many liters would fill in seven and a half minutes, so you could have done this times by seven and a half and found that it was um, less than 79.8, that would also work. That would also work. Okay. Ah, yeah, somebody said, will an exclamation mark annoy the examiner? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't actually do this in the exam. It doesn't matter if you do, you could do that. Um, I just do it, you know, because I'm live, so it's for a bit of effect. Um, but I mean, it shouldn't affect the examiner. Maybe if they've had a very bad day, they're going to get a little bit annoyed by it, but they still have to give you all the marks. They still have to give all the marks. <laughs> um, okay, question 10, question 10. Looking at the chat now, if you have any questions about that previous one, let me know. This is probably, I don't wanna say this to like 
because I know a lot of you still won't get this, but I would say this is maybe the nicest five marker I've ever seen. Once you know how to get into the question, this, I'm amazed that it's five marks, but hey, the more the better, the more the better. That's what, that's what we're saying. Um, but guys, I want to really emphasize this. Don't get biased by the people in the chat. Don't get biased by the people in the chat. Um, everyone in the chat, keep your comments coming. It's absolutely awesome. It's the best, the best way. But I just want to say to those people who maybe aren't getting the, the questions um, right as often as some people, um, don't be biased by the chat. The majority of people will be finding this difficult. The majority will definitely be finding this difficult. Do you need the triangle equation from the formula sheet for this? No, you don't. No, you don't. But we do need to use what we know about equilateral triangles. We do know what we need to know about equilateral triangles. Somebody said, work out X first. No, you are exactly right. You are exactly right. Let's have a look. Different ways to do this. Different ways to do this. But the best one is going to be to use the fact that the side lengths in an equilateral triangle are all the same. That means that we can say that this side length here is equal to this side length here and set up an equation to find the value of X. We can then use that to find the perimeter because once we have X, we can find all of our side lengths and add them together. So we can say that the side length here, 6X minus 10, has to be equal to the side length over here, 4X plus 5. This is an equation which we can solve. We can firstly get all the x's onto one side. We're going to subtract 4x from both sides. We get 2x minus 10 equals 5. We can then add 10 to both sides to move the 10 to the other side. We get 2x equals 15. And finally, we can divide both sides by 2 to get the x on its own. We get x equals 15 divided by 2, which is 7.5. You can use your calculator for that. The next step, guys, what's it going to be? Well, now we have the value of x, and we can use that value of x to find the side lengths of the triangle. This side length here is going to be 6 times by 7.5 minus 10, 4 times by 7.5 plus 5, and 10 times by 7.5 minus 4. We can write all of that out, and it's going to give us something which we can either work out by hand, but I wouldn't do that. I would just type it into the calculator. So we're going to have 6 times by x, so 6 times by 7.5, subtract 10, that's this one up here. And then we're going to have plus 4 times by 7.5, plus 5, that's this one up here. And then we're going to have plus 10 times by 7.5 minus 4. Now, you could, if you wanted to, simplify that and uh, work it out by hand, or you could just type it into your calculator. And if you typed it into your calculator, guys, you would get 105. You would get 105. What does that tell us? It tells us that the overall perimeter of the triangle is 105 centimeters, which means is the perimeter of the triangle greater than one meter? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The perimeter is going to be greater than... One meter is going to be 105 centimeters, and there are 100 centimeters in a meter, so 105 is going to be greater than a meter. Looking at the chat now, guys, give me a quick bit of feedback on that question. How do we find it? Do we have any questions? Let me know. Let me know. Okay, Emanuela says, wasn't too bad, to be fair. Come on. Nice, nice. Naeem says it was okay. Not too bad. Okay, okay. Well done to those of you who got that right. Those of you who didn't, hopefully it makes sense now. If it doesn't make sense now, then uh, make sure you drop any questions you have in the chat. Okay, no questions. Let's move on to the next one. We have questions 11 and 12 on the screen. A couple of two markers. Hey, Marina, that is great to hear. That's great to hear. Glad, uh, glad it's helpful. 
Um, when are you doing edXL? We'll be back on the edXL tomorrow. Um, somebody said, what if it didn't say equilateral? Would it be the same? If it didn't say equilateral, then it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same. And the reason is because we wouldn't be able to say that all of the side lengths are the same size. If it was an isosceles triangle, we could have used the two side lengths, which are the same, and use those two to find the value of x. But if it didn't even say it was isosceles, then we don't know anything about the lengths of the sides, so we wouldn't be able to do it like that. Okay, guys, a little bit of a funky question here. And you can, you can tell, actually, you guys should start watching it. Whenever we do a question which looks difficult, a lot of people leave the stream and then people join back a few minutes later. So uh, if you're somebody who's sticking with it all the way through, big congratulations because, uh, yeah, you guys are going to be making some really good progress. Okay, guys, looking at the chat now, K said, why is there only two marks? Um, yeah, it's a bit annoying for two marks. Famalam Kuz says, don't you just type it in your calculator? Yes, sir, that is exactly what you do. That is exactly what you do. You guys might have noticed I just went silent. That's because I was busy typing. I was busy typing. Robin says, ready. I think a few of us are going to be ready. It's only a two marker. Let me talk about it, guys. Let me talk about it. So this question says, an approximation for the value of pi is given by... Uh, four times by all of this. And then it says, use your calculator to show that this approximation is within 0.1 of 3.14. What are we going to have to do here, guys? Well, we're going to have to find the value of this. And I've just typed this into my calculator. You guys can see 3.0418396. That is what we're going to get. So let me just write that down. 3.0418396. Now, how are we going to show that this approximation is within 0.1 of 3.14? Well, we're going to find the difference between this and 3.14. So we're going to do 3.14 minus this number, 3.14 minus this number. And when we do that, what are we going to get? The best way to do this, guys, is going to be, say if we have this on our calculator, to either just do minus 3.14, which you could do, and you would get this. Now, technically, we did this, subtract this, but you could just take the negative off. You would get 0 0.9816. Or you could do um, have this as your answer and then do 3.14, subtract your answer, and you would get the positive version, 0 0.098. So we get 0 0.098, etc. cetera, dot, 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 dot. And this is less than 0 0.1. So we have shown that it is within 0 0.1 of 3.14. Guys, hopefully that made sense. Any questions, let me know. A little bit of a pesky question, that, because this looks pretty intimidating when you read it, but it's not actually too bad when you know how to do it. Somebody said I typed a symbol in wrong. Yeah, James, that is so annoying, right? Um, somebody said, can you round 0 0.1 and 3.04? ADZ, if you make that a bit more specific, then uh, then I can go through it. Bree said, annoying to type out. Yep. I'm very quick on a calculator because I've done so much math, but it was very annoying even for me, to be honest. Uh, do I need to know any more numbers of pi? Nope, you definitely don't. If you want to know the numbers of pi, you can just type pi into your calculator and it will just say it for you. So you can just type pi in, have it written as a decimal, and then it will just write them all out. I know there's some 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 people in the world who know like, a thousand digits of pi like until two weeks ago i probably only knew the first two and uh i've and that's taken me to doing university level maths and beyond so you definitely don't need to know anything about the specific digits of pi can you round the approximation to 3.04 and then subtract and round the answer to 0 0.1 um no you can't because um that would actually be showing that it isn't within 0.1. That would actually be showing that it isn't within 0.1. So you would have to just write out the digits. And as long as this number here is less than 0.1, then you've got your answer. Oh, found them. that's quite impressive, actually. That's quite impressive. 
the only reason that I actually learned more is because someone who I was tutoring, uh, like told me about the Pi song. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's like this YouTube video and uh, somebody has made <laughs> Pi to a song and that it's actually super catchy. So now I know like 10 or something, but let's have a look guys. Work out 9.12 times by 10 to the 10 over 3.2 times by 10 to the four. Yeah, a lot of people have heard of the Pi song, fair play, fair play. Guys, how are we going to do this? There's going to be a couple of different ways, but the best way I would say is going to be to just type this into our calculator, see what number we get, and then convert that into standard form. So typing this into the calculator, we have 9.12 divided by 10 to the power of 10 over 3.2 times by 10 to the power of 4. If we type that into our calculator, what do we get? Um, and I, yeah, guys, even I typed it in wrong. I typed divide instead of times. Just give me one second. Let me type that in again. Um, there we go. That's better. We get 28500000. So 2,850,000. Now, how do we convert this into standard form? To write this in standard form, we need to write it as some number between 1 and 10. That's going to be 2.85 times by 10 to some power. Now, the question is, how many places have we moved the decimal point? We've moved it one, two, three, four, five, six places. So our power is going to be six. 2.85 times by 10 to the power of six. That, guys, is going to be our answer to question 12. Nicely done, Luckman. Nicely done, Hasburn. Um, guys, good work, good work. Okay, a lot of people are a lot of people are aiming for sevens. Nice. Um, okay, question thirteen on the screen, guys. I'd say this is a bit of an annoying question. Let's have a look. Ah, Simon, great question. You said when is it a negative power? So, in my opinion, the best way to remember it is basically if you have a very big number or just a big number, for example, two hundred eighty or two thousand eight hundred and fifty, and you write it in standard form then your power is going to be positive. So if you're writing a big number in standard form, your power is going to be positive. But if you're writing a very small number in standard form, your power is going to be negative. So say if it was this, 0 0.0085, because this is a very small number, when we write it in standard form, our power is going to be negative. But if it's a very big number, when we write it in standard form, such as this, our power is going to be positive. Hopefully that clears it up, Sidemen. Um, if you've got another question, let me know and I can uh, I can answer it. Hey, AMT, no worries at all. No worries at all. It's good to have you when we do. Yeah, AMT, don't worry. You don't have to apologize. Ah, that's great to hear, Sidemen. I know that I know that little uh, that little detail trips a lot of people up, but that's the best way to think about it. Guys, let me know in the chat. Are we ready? Are we ready? We're almost halfway through this paper now. Yeah, a lot of people weren't liking paper one. Dot, dot, dot said, does this paper have differentials? Nope, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, Love Heart's ready. Angela's ready. Alina's ready. And yeah, is ready. Okay, guys, let's have a look. It says, Ashraf is going to put boxes into a crate. The crate is a cuboid measuring 2.5 by 2 by 1.2. Each box is a cube of length 50 centimeters. He does these calculations. He works out the volume of the crate, times is all the lengths, he gets six. He works out the volume of one box, he times is um, the length, converts it into, into meters, which is perfect, gets his answer, and then he divides the volume of the crate by the volume of one box to work out the total number of boxes he can fit, 48. What do we reckon, guys? Is Ashraf correct? Let me know in the chat. What do we think? Is Ashraf correct? Let's have a look. Okay, ADZ thinks he's correct. Muller thinks he's correct. And unfortunately, guys, Ashraf is actually not correct. He's actually not correct. And I know that's going to have a lot of you thinking, what? Why is that the case? How is he not correct? Marina got it. Nicely done, Marina. The reason is because he has assumed that the cubes or the um, boxes, I should say, fit perfectly and stack perfectly inside this crate. 
but we can actually see that they don't fit perfectly inside the crate. You see how this is 0.5? Is it going to fit perfectly inside a width of 1.2? Because 2.5 and 2 are both multiples of 0.5, the box would fit perfectly in these dimensions. But because this is not a multiple of 0.5, the box wouldn't fit perfectly in this dimension. Therefore, no, he wouldn't fit 48 boxes in the crate. And our answer, evaluate his method and claim. So his claim is incorrect, we can say that. Or his claim is wrong. And in fact, it would be fewer. It would be fewer. That is what we can say. It would be fewer. That is what we're going to say for that. His claim is wrong. And in fact, it would be less. The reason is because the dimensions aren't a perfect match to the boxes. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. Let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah, Simon said, Ashraf has not been watching my GCSE maths exactly. He needs to, uh, he needs to get on the TikTok. He needs to get on the TikTok. Okay, question 14. The cross section of a prism has n sides. Circle the expression for the number of edges of the prism. I'm going to give you guys about 30 seconds to do this, and then we'll go through it. Would I say about the dimensions in my answer? Um, you wouldn't actually have to. You wouldn't actually have to. Um, you could just say he's incorrect, but it would be... Actually, actually, no, sorry, sorry. Ignore what I just said. Yes, you'd have to say uh, his claim is wrong because it doesn't fit perfectly, or 1.2 is not a multiple of 0 0.5, and then say for the, uh, for the evaluation, um, it would actually be fewer. Question 14, guys, what do we think? Jamie Dillon thinks it's 3N. Does anybody agree? Let's have a look in the chat. Okay, JTG thinks it's 3N. Okay, and you guys are correct. Very well done. The answer is in fact going to be 3N. And the best way to kind of visualize this is to think about if we had, for example, a triangular prism, this is a three-sided prism. It has three sides here, three sides on the other end. So that gives us our 2n. And then we also have one, two, three sides here. We would have the exact same thing going on if, for example, it was a um, hexagon prism or a hexagonal prism. We would have the six on the end face. We would have the six across here. And we would have the six on the other face. So we have three times that number of sides. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. So we have the three sides here, or the number of sides here. So one times n here, another n going around it, and then another n on the other side. Same over here, we have the n here. In this case, n would be six. We have the n here, these ones here. So that's our second lot. And then our third lot is going to be the ones on the other face. Guys, I'm going to put the next question on the screen. Question 15. If you have any questions about that last one, let me know um, and I can answer. This one's quite a nice question. I'd say this is quite an important question because this type of thing comes up quite a lot. Um, Beatrice said, wait, can you explain that again, please? Um, yeah, I can explain that again. Basically, um, when it comes to our um, prism, we have... Whatever the shape is, let's say it's a, a cuboid, which is technically still a prism, or say it's a pentagon. And the question asks us the number of sides of the um, prism. When it comes to working out the number of sides, we always have the sides which are on this face, which is one of our ends. Our answer was 3n. We have the sides which are on the other face, which gives us our other set of n sides. And then we have the sides which run along the prism like this. In the same way, this is quite hard to explain without having a physical, um, a physical model, but hopefully that makes sense. And whatever the shape is, we're always going to have the ones which run along it and the ones on either side of the face, which combine to give us three lots of the number of sides. Let me know in the chat if that made sense this time. Hey, Jamie Dillon's got to go. No worries at all. No worries at all. Mate, it's been good to have you uh, up until this point. It's been good to have you up until this point. Stepper says, what's going on tomorrow? Tomorrow, we're going to be doing an Edexcel higher paper too. Ah, Beatrice, great to hear it makes sense now. That's so good. That's so good. Um, 
Gecko said, isn't density equal to mass over volume? Yes, you are correct. Let me put that on the screen. Density equals mass over volume. That is going to help us here. That is going to help us. And rearranging this, some of you will think of it as a triangle, or you can rearrange this. If we wanted to find mass, we would have to multiply both sides by V to get mass on its own. Density times by volume equals mass. That's my second hint, and then I will go through it. Then I will go through it. Yeah, I was, I was happy they put the pressure formula on paper one. Yeah, yeah. So you actually don't have to know the pressure formula, but you do have to know the volume one. Guys, we just got to halfway through this paper, by the way. Um, would one of the, actually, Famalam, would you mind setting up a poll which asks people about the pace? I'm just wondering whether you guys want me to A, stay the same, B, slow down, or C, speed up. I think the pace should be pretty good, but let me know. Uh, yeah, nice, nice. Okay, a couple of people saying faster, guys. Don't put it in the comments, just put it in the uh, put it in the poll. Okay, let's have a look at this question. User 2652 is new. Welcome, my friend. Good to have you. Good to have you. Um, let's have a look. Question 15. The volume of a metal is 45 centimeters cubed. The metal is made from copper and tin. The ratio of the volume of copper to the volume of tin is 22 to 3. We're also told that the density of copper is 8.96 and the density of tin is 7.31. We're asked to work out the mass of the metal. Now, how are we going to work out the mass of the metal when we know the density of the materials and we can work out the volume that we have? We're going to use the fact that density is equal to mass over volume and more specifically, we're going to times both sides by volume to get density times by volume equals mass. So we know that to find the mass of this metal, we need to multiply the density of the objects by the volume that we have. How are we going to work out those two things? Well, we're given the densities. What about the volumes? How could we work out the volume of copper and the volume of tin? Well, we know that in total we have 45 centimeters cubed of material, 45 centimeters cubed. And what fraction of that is copper? We know that the ratio of the volume of copper to the volume of tin is 22 to 3. That means we have 25 parts in total, and 22 out of those 25 parts are copper. So that means that 22 25ths of our material is copper, and 3 25ths of our material is tin. We can use the ratio of the materials to find the fraction of the value, which is each of them. Where can we go from there? Well, either we could calculate this and then multiply it by something, but I'm just going to do it in one step. 45 times by 22 over 25, that's going to tell us the volume of copper that we have. What is the density or what's yeah what's the density of copper it's 8.96 so we know that the volume is this we can multiply that then by the density to find the weight 8.96 so we can type this into our calculator 45 times by 22 over 25 gives us our volume times by our density of copper if we do 45 times by 22 over 25 times by 8.96, what are we going to get, guys? We're going to get 354.816. Now we can use the exact same logic and multiply the volume of tin that we have by the density of tin, which is 7.31. So we can do 45 times by our 3 over 25, which is the fraction of our material, which is tin, times by our density of tin, which was 7.31. When we do that, guys, and type it into our calculator, we get 39.474. We now have the weight of our copper, and we have the weight of our tin. Our final step is going to be to add those together to get our total weight. So we can do 354.816, plus 39.474 to get our answer. 354.816 plus 39.474. What are we going to get, guys, adding those together? We get 394.29, which is going to be our answer for the mass in grams. That, guys, 
is going to be our answer. Looking at the chat, Marina, come on, nicely done. Says 394.29. Zed Khan says the same thing. Good work. Kira said, why do we multiply by 8.96 and 7.31? Fantastic question. The reason is because we know that density is, e sorry, that mass is equal to density times by volume. Hopefully that part makes sense. What we did here was we found out the volume of each of the shapes. So that was a volume of copper. This was our volume of tin. And then we multiplied by the density, which they gave us in the question, to find our masses. Hopefully that made sense. And said, can I screenshot? Definitely. Giving you guys some time to screenshot now. Angela says, I got it now. That is exactly what we want to hear. That is the sound of progress. Well done. Well done. Hey, that's great to hear, Kira. Any more questions? Let me know. Uh, JTJII said, what if you put 394.290? You would also get the marks. You would also get the marks. That's cool. And uh, apostrophe said, get it now. That is what we like to hear. That is the sweet sound of progress. Okay. Question 16 is now on the screen. Just because you don't have this paper printed off, don't use that as an excuse not to do this question. Um, this, uh, this one is one that you can definitely do just by looking at it. You're not necessarily going to need it printed out. Zaki says, run the likes up. Maybe we could, but I don't think so. Let's, uh, let's rest your guys' hands ahead of next week, eh? I think that's important. This is a one marker, guys, so I'm not going to give you long. I know a few of you are going to be skipping it as well, because even though I said you could do it, you'll still be skipping it. Um, let's have a look. It says, use the graph to estimate the median mass of apples. How are we going to do that? Well, when we're given cumulative frequency, we can look at the top number to work out our total frequency. We can see that the frequency goes up to 50, so we have 50 apples in total. And in fact, it gave it in the question. What does that mean about our median? Well, our median is going to be the one which, if we line everything up from smallest to biggest, is in the middle. It's going to be halfway through. In this case, it's going to be our 25th apple, half of 50. So we go over to our cumulative frequency on the y-axis, and we can see that this is where 25 is. We draw across to our cumulative frequency curve, and then we draw down. We can see that this is 106, so our answer, guys, is going to be 106. If you said 105 because it wasn't the clearest, that's completely fine. Um, it would be a lot clearer if you actually had the paper. Um, so 106 for um, 16A. What about 16B then? It says, estimate the proportion of apples that have a mass greater than 115 grams. How are we going to do this one? Well, this time, we want to work out the frequency which is associated with 115 grams. This time, instead of drawing across from the cumulative frequency, we're going to draw up from the mass of 115 grams. We go up from 115, and then we go across. We get 42, and that's because each box is worth one. And the question says, estimate the proportion of the apples that have a mass greater than 115. We want the number of apples which have a mass greater, so it's going to be between 42 and 50. That's going to be 8, because 50 subtract 42 is 8. Is that our final answer? No, it's not, because it wants the proportion of apples. What we need to do then is we need to just write that number 8 over our total number of apples. It's 8 out of 50 apples, which have a mass greater than 115, and that, guys, is going to be our answer. 8 over 50 because there were eight apples above 115 out of 50 in total. Yeah, that would have tripped a lot of people up, family. That would have tripped a lot of people up. Hopefully it made sense, though. Marina said, oh, okay, makes sense. Yes, love to see it, love to see it. Sound of realization, well done. Um, Zed Khan said, simplify to four over 25. You could do that, but you don't have to, because it doesn't say to write it in its simplest form. Antonia said, would you get the mark if you just put eight? No, you wouldn't, unfortunately. No, you wouldn't. Um, the reason is because it asks not for the number, but for the proportion. So you have to put over 50. Ah, actually, sorry, sorry. I just saw it was two marks. I thought it was a one marker. Yeah, you would get one mark for eight. You would get one mark for eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd get one mark for eight. I was thinking it was a one marker. 
Um, but yeah, because it's a two marker, um, yeah, you would get one mark for eight and the other mark would be for the eight over 50. You don't have to simplify. You don't have to simplify. Hopefully that makes sense. Next question, 17 and 18 are both on the screen. Let's have a look. This one's going to require a little bit of trial and error, a little bit of legwork. Simon said, is this up to 7 p.m.? Um, I think we should finish at about 7. Maybe we're going to go a little bit over. Um, tops, it'll be 10 past or quarter past. ADZ said 18B is very long. It depends on how you do it. 18B um, could be long or it could not take too long. T said, let's go. Come on. Guys, one mark of this. And I know a few of you are going to be racking your brains. Let me put you out of your misery. Let's have a look. Question 17. It says A is a prime number. And it says B is an even number. It then says N equals A squared plus A times B. Circle the correct statement about N. What do we reckon, guys? What are you betting? Odd, even, always prime. Could be odd or even. What are we saying? <laughs> okay, said, I just closed my eyes and circle whichever one on these questions. Yep. Well, let me know which one you went for and let's see. Um, okay, a few people saying even or odd. Guys, you are correct. Well done. It could be even or odd. And the best way to do this is going to be to use a bit of trial and error or just plug in a few values and see what we get. Now, because AB is a prime number times by an even number, this part is always going to be even. So this is always going to be even because any number multiplied by an even number is always even. If, N, if, sorry, if A squared is odd, we're going to have an odd number plus an even number, which gives us an odd number. If A squared is, I don't know which one I just said, but if A squared is, sorry, if A is odd, A squared will be odd. A squared plus an even number will be odd. But if A is even, then we're going to have even plus even, which is going to be even. Now, some of you will be thinking, yeah, but all prime numbers are odd. Actually, two is going to be a prime number because it has exactly two factors, one in itself. And that is going to be, in fact, our only even prime number. So when we plug two in as our prime number, this will be even. Any other prime number, it'll be odd. So we can see that it could be even or it could be odd. Um, Star said they just want you to put a bunch of numbers and guess. To be honest, that's true, but they specifically want to make sure that you include the number two, because if you don't include two as your prime number, then you would be thinking that it's always odd, which isn't actually the case. Okay, 18A, we have a two marker here, guys. Let's have a look. Net trust, he says, is one prime. One is not a prime number. Um, the reason is because one has um, exactly one factor as opposed to two. Um, that, by the way, though, guys, is a mistake that so many people made in, in their paper one. Loads of people have been saying to me that they accidentally put um, one as a prime number. Hey, guys, when you're working under pressure, these things happen. It would have only been worth one mark. You just got to bounce back and roll with it. Okay, question 18. I've given you guys a couple of minutes. Let's have a look. It says a bag contains 20 discs, 10 are red, 7 are blue, and 3 are green. Marnie, that's a nice name, takes a disc at random before putting it back in the bag. Nick then takes a disc at random before putting it back in the bag. Ollie then takes a disc at random. Work out the probability that they all take a red disc. So we're going to have to work out, guys, the probability of taking a red on the first pick. Multiply that by the probability of taking a red on the second pick. And multiply that by the probability of taking red on the first pick. Sorry, on the third pick. What's it going to be? Well, um, all need to be red. There are 10 red discs. So on the first one, we have 10 over 20 as our probability. Then we need another red disc. Well, Marnie puts it back in the bag. So it's actually going to stay as 10 over 20. And then Nick, after he takes it, puts it back in the bag as well. So it stays as 10 over 20 again. So we have 10 over 20 times 10 over 20 times 10 over 20. You can type that into your calculator. When you do, you get 1 over 8 as your answer. People saying 0 0.5 cubed. Yeah, that's completely fine. 0 0.5 cubed, that would give you 1 over 8. That would give you 1 over 8. Okay, next question, guys. I'm going to say this one's going to be a little bit more challenging. Let's have a look. And I'm just going to copy and paste this information. So you have it for this question. They've given us some space to draw a tree diagram. 
if we want to, but I don't know if that's necessary or it's not necessary. <laughs> Let's have a look. 18B. Can you use a tree? Yes, you can. Are we going to? No, we're not. We're not going to use a tree. But if you do use a tree and get the same answer, that's completely fine. Question 18B says, all 20 discs are in the bag. Reggie takes three discs at random, one after the other. After he takes a disc, he does not put it back in the bag. Reggie's first disc is blue. Work out the probability that all three discs are different colors. Now, guys, a couple of different ways to do this. However, you don't need to use a tree diagram. Looking at the chat, ADZ said, I've been sitting here doing a tree. Yep. I'm going to show you guys a very quick way to do this. Hopefully it will make sense. Uh, no worries, Karima. It was one over eight. That was the answer to the previous one. Bree said, how many questions? There are 29 questions. Guys, let me know. Are you ready for me to talk through this one? Let me know. Let me know. I know a lot of you are going to be going, oh, okay. Let's have a look. Okay, a few people are ready. Family, I'm ready. Bree's ready. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. It says, all 20 discs are in the bag. Reggie takes three discs at random, one after the other. After he takes a disc, he does not put it back in the bag. Reggie's first disc is blue. Work out the probability that all three discs are different colors. There are going to be a couple of different ways after taking a blue disc, that all of the um, that all of the what are they discs are different colors. Either the next disc is red, and then the next disc is green, or the next disc is green and then the next disc is red. Let me write that a little bit more clearly, actually. So either first we have red, second we have green, or second. Can we or first we have green and second we have red hopefully that bit makes sense so far so two different ways forward now either we have red then green or we have green then red they're the only two ways because we know we've already taken a blue disc out what's the probability now of getting a red and then a green well on that second pick there are going to be how many red discs in the bag well he's taken one out but that disc was blue so that means there are still the original number which is 10 red discs in but he's taken one disc out so instead of there being 20 in total there are going to be 19 discs in total we're going to multiply that by what's the probability now of getting a green one let me actually just write out again there were what was it 10 red yeah 10 red 7 blue 10 red 7 blue 3 green so the probability of our next one being green, well, there's going to be three green ones left in because we took one blue and then one red and 18 in total. Now, applying that exact same logic to choosing green and then red, what do we have? Well, on our first pick, there's going to be three green and 19 in total. And on the next pick, there's going to be how many red? There's going to be 10 red and there's going to be 18 discs in total. What we can do is we can figure out what these are. 10 over 19 times by 3 over 18, if we typed into our calculator, is going to be 5 over 57. And if we type this into our calculator, again, we're going to get 5 over 57. These are the two different ways that he has all three different colors. So we can add those two probabilities to get the total probability. We get 5 over 57 plus 5 over 57. You can do that on the calculator or just use your adding fractions. Only add the numerators. We get 10 over 57 as our final answer. Now, I know I did actually end up going a little bit around the houses with that explanation, but hopefully it was clear. Otherwise, I can, uh, I can explain it again because I know I ended up writing this back on halfway through. Um, so it might have disrupted the flow a bit.
ADZ said, don't you have to worry about the blue as well? You actually don't have to worry about the blue. The reason is because you already know that the first disc taken out was blue. So now you're in a new reality where the first disc is blue. That's guaranteed that's already happened. Now that the first disc is blue, there's two different ways that you can have all three being different colors. Either now that you've taken the blue, you get red then green, or now that you've taken the blue, you get green then red. If you get red then green, you have on your second pick 10 red in the bag, 19 in total. And then on your third pick, you have three green in the bag, 18 in total. So you times those together because they both have to happen. You get five over 57. And then you do the same with the green and red. You get five over 57 again, and you add them together. Naeem said, ah, that makes sense. Okay, sweet sound of progress. To those of you thinking, oh my God, I'm still lost. I don't know what's going on. This is a tricky question. This is a tricky question. Very few people out of the 130 listening um, will have got this. But if you did, get, if you do get it now, nicely done. Famalam says, get it now. Awesome, awesome. K said, wait, why did you swap the denominators? Um, let me know specifically what you mean and I can answer that. Sidemen says, yeah, brain is frazzled. Don't worry about it, mate. Don't worry about it. This is a grade eight question. This is a grade eight question. Um, some people would even say this is a grade nine question. Um, so yeah, if, if, uh, if you struggle with this, especially if you're aiming for a four, five, six, seven, um, don't let it stress you out. But if you do get it now, congratulations. Cause that's a good, that's a good, um, good bit of progress. And actually let me say as well, um, somebody just said, um, I did a tree and got so confused, James. Yeah, this is a thing. You know what exam, what the examiners do? And it does annoy me a bit. They put all this focus on tree diagrams, right? They put all this focus on tree diagrams and in school they focus on tree diagrams. But normally, unless they draw a tree diagram for you, a tree diagram isn't actually gonna be the best method to solving a question. Like this is way easier, it's still difficult, but way easier than drawing out a tree diagram. Um, but they give you all this space and they're like trying to bait you in, throwing the, throwing the bait out to draw a tree diagram when in reality you don't need one. And that's actually true for most of these probability questions when they don't already draw the tree diagram for you. If they already draw it out, then of course you have to use it and you have to fill in the gaps. I think that was in one, the paper one, right? Um, but if they don't draw it out for you, normally the best approach is actually going to be not to worry about drawing it. Okay, next question, guys, we're going to move on. Um, question 19 and 20 are on the screen. For those of you who have been watching the TikToks on proof, give this one a go. Give this one a go. This will be uh, either you'll love it or you'll hate it. But either way, it's, it's a good one for learning proof. I know that most people hate proof, though, having said that. Okay, people are not liking the look of these, this proof stuff. Yeah, and also these two topics are missed off so often in school, to be honest. That's why I do quite a lot of um, TikToks about the proof stuff. And it's also why I cover these a lot in the past papers. Schools, there's some certain topics that schools miss off a lot. Um, but uh, But yeah, after this, hopefully they'll make sense. They're two pretty tricky questions, though, I've got to tell you. Question 19, guys. Drop ready in the chat when you're ready for me to go through it. Um, okay, Star says ready. Nice. Karima says ready. Angela says ready. No one's ready, dots ready. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. Two tricky questions. Let's see what we can do. Question 19, lunch. <laughs> That's a bit bold, isn't it? Whoever went to a restaurant and said, and it just said lunch in bold. I don't know what they're doing. Um, so it says lunch, choose one starter and one main course. There are four starters and 10 main courses to choose from. Four starters, 10 main courses, two of the starters and three of the main courses are suitable for vegans. What percentage of the possible lunches have both courses suitable for vegans? Guys, what we're going to have to do is work out the number suitable for vegans and the number in total. And we're going to have to do the number for vegans 
divided by or over the number in total. That's going to tell us what percentage, and this will be a fraction. We then just have to convert it into a percentage um, or appropriate for vegans. So how many different options are there for vegans? Well, vegans can choose from two starters and three main courses. So in total, there are two times by three options for vegans. To work out the number of total options, we can multiply the number of starters op that they can choose from by the number of mains they can choose from. What about the number in total? Well, in total, what do we have? In total, we have four starters and 10 main courses. So we're going to do four times by um, 10. This gives us six over 40, which is a fraction that we can convert into a percentage. How do we convert a fraction into a percentage? We multiply it by 100. So we do 6 over 40 times by 100. If we type that into our calculator, guys, what are we going to get? We're going to get 15 as our answer, 15%. Now, I know a lot of you are going to be very confused by this combination thing. How did we know it was 2 times 3 and 4 times 10? Whenever you have a question like this, which has a combination of different things, here we have a combination of starters and a combination of mains. What we do is we multiply the number of different options at each of the different stages. Hopefully that made sense. Any questions, let me know, guys. Otherwise, we can talk about question 20. Antonio said, I sort of get that. Cool. Come on. That is nice. Um, sort of get that is a lot better than not at all, because that means next time you do a question like this, you'll actually get it. So, uh, so yeah. Let's have a look. Izzy said 20 looks so bad. Yeah, this does look nasty, but let me say, or this is going to be a very good learning question. Guys, this is a nasty question. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people hate proof. I know, but let me tell you, once you understand the general gist of it, Proof questions become a lot easier very quickly. So even though it's difficult, please make sure that you keep an open mind with this one because um, it's going to illustrate a lot of the principles. Let's have a look. It says n is a positive integer, and then it asks us to prove algebraically that 2n squared times by 3 over n plus n plus 6n times by n squared minus 1 is a cube number. What we're going to have to do, guys, is simplify this as much as possible and show that the result is a cube number. How are we going to do that? Well, first off, let's simplify this. So we're going to expand these brackets. Firstly, we have 2n squared times by 3 over n. That is going to give us 6n. Why is it 6n? It's 6n because 2 times by 3 gives us that 6. And then on the top, we have n squared. On the bottom, we have n. n squared divided by n, we just get n. So that's why that's uh, 6n. Then we have 2n squared times by n. We get 2n cubed. Next up, expanding these brackets here, 6n times by n squared. That's going to be 6n cubed. And then we have 6n times by minus 1. That's going to be minus 6n. All we've done here, guys, is we've expanded those brackets. But I know this first expansion was a little bit annoying. Next, we're going to simplify this. We can do 6n minus 6n. They cancel each other out. 2n cubed plus 6n cubed. That's going to be 8n cubed. Now, how can we show that this is a cube number? We can write it as some number cubed. Some number cubed. Now, how can we do that? Well, we spot that 8 is a cube number. 8 is what cubed? 8 is 2 cubed. So we can actually write this as 2n cubed. And we've now shown that this is a cube number. This is 2n cubed. What do we think? Let me know, guys. Does that make sense when I went through it? So 8n cubed is equal to 2n cubed. Um, Nev says it's okay. Kind of makes sense. Hey, that's a step in the right direction. Big step in the right direction. Somebody said, can you please explain the first expansion again? Yep, definitely. Um, explaining this expansion in a little bit more detail. Let's have a look. So the first thing I'm going to say is that you can do this quickly by doing 2 times n squared is... Sorry, you can do this quickly by doing 2n squared times 3 is 6n squared over n is 6n. But let me talk about the underlying logic of why this is the case. So we want to show why 
2n squared times by 3 over n is equal to 6n. Let's do that now. So we want to show y. 2n squared times by 3 over n is equal to 6n. How are we going to do this? Let's think about this as a number times by a fraction. How can we do, or how can we make this clearer? We can think about this as a, num as a fraction times by another fraction. We can write 2n squared as 2n squared over 1 and think about it like this. Now we're multiplying two fractions. Hopefully that made sense. 2n squared is just the same as 2n squared over 1. So now we have 2n squared over 1 times by 3 over n. How do you multiply two fractions together? You times the top by the top and the bottom times the bottom. 2n squared times by 3 is 6n squared. 1 times by n is n. Now we have an algebraic fraction. We can divide the top and bottom both by n. Um, we get on the top 6n. On the bottom we get 1. Any number divided by itself, sorry, any number divided by 1 is just itself. So we get 6n. Hopefully that made that a little bit more clear. Family Lamb said, oh, okay, that sounds like it made a bit more sense. Um, and Naeem said, now that makes sense. Come on. Izzy said it makes sense. Ah, good, 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 guys. I know a lot of you are still going to be confused by this. Don't get me wrong. The majority will still be confused. But to those of you who that now made sense for, nicely done. Nicely done. That is how we, we simplified that. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Let me know. Um... Where's 3 over n from? Uh, that was in the question here. So we were just showing why 2n squared times by 3 over n was equal to 6n. So I just wrote it on its own over there and, uh, and explained it that way. Okay, looking at the next question, guys. Question 21. There are 29 in total. I think we're going to go a little bit past 7 o'clock today, but we will get the paper finished. Let's have a look. Question 21. Fairly standard question. Y is inversely proportional to the square root of X. When Y is 4, X is 9. Work out an equation connecting Y and X. Okay. Looking at the chat, guys, any questions, let me know and I can answer them. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds and we will go through it. Uh, Palmida says, do you know any other uh, pages that do mass higher at Excel papers? Off the top of my head, I don't, but I do do Excel papers. I just switch between AQA and Excel. So today's AQA, tomorrow will be Excel, and we just alternate like that. Somebody asking what equation we need to use. We need to use, or actually, let me just go through it. I've given you guys a few minutes now. Let me just go through it. Um, if you don't understand this at the moment or you weren't sure how to get into it, listen, uh, listen carefully. Let's have a look. It says, why is inversely proportional? Y is equal to K over the square root of X. Y is equal to K over the square root of X. So when it's inversely proportional, it's K over. And because it's the square root of X, we do K over the square root of X. Then what do we do? We plug in the values of X and Y that we know and use that to find the value of K. Let's have a look. We know that when Y is 4, so 4 equals K times by, or sorry, K over um, the square root of X. X is 9, so we have the square root of 9. Next up, we can rearrange this to find the value of K. First off, let's do this square root of 9. 4 equals k over the square root of 9, which is 3. Now we can times both sides by 3. We get that k is equal to 12. So what is the equation going to be that links y and x? We have y is equal to k, which is 12, over the square root of x. That, guys, is going to be our answer for the equation linking them together. The next part then says work out the value of y when x is equal to 25. What are we going to do here, guys? Well, we're just going to plug in um, that x is equal to 25 and see what that gives us as the value for y. Our equation y equals 12 over the square root of x. We're going to get y equals 12 over 
the square root of 25. This is something that we could either bing into the calculator or simplify by hand. What we're gonna get is 2.4. Why is 2.4? That is gonna be our answer to that one. Now, if you accidentally got the wrong value for k up here, maybe you thought it was 10, and then you carried that error forward and you said 10 over the square root of 25, which would have been two, then you would still get both of the marks. So they'll give you error carried forward for this if you accidentally, uh, if you accidentally messed it up. Okay, looking at the chat now, guys, any questions, let me know. Otherwise, questions 22 and 23 are both on the screen. Question 22 is gonna trip a lot of you guys up. I think this is gonna trip a lot of people up. Let's have a look. Yeah, this one, uh, yeah, not many people like the factorizing side of things, or maybe they do like factorizing in general, but this has a little bit of an extra, kind of an extra step. Let's see, uh, let's see if we can do it. And guys, any questions, let me know now. I'm looking at the chat. Any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I can go through it. Oh, I didn't actually check, or I did at the time, but what was the poll saying about the speed? Um, oh, it's gone now. I think it was like 70% said good speed. Does anybody know off the top of their head what the poll for the speed was saying? I think it was majority said good speed. Um, yeah, 68% good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, also, guys, Towards the back end of the session, I will also be asking for any feedback if you guys have any suggestions for how we could improve the streams. So get thinking now if there's anything uh, if there's anything you think we could do differently. I'm not gonna take anything as like an insult or I'm not gonna get offended by anything. Um, I'd just love to know if there's any ways we can improve it. So, uh, so yeah, get thinking now and uh, you can drop them in the chat later. Let's have a look at question 22 then. It says, simplify fully x to the power of five minus 4x cubed over 3x minus 6. Now, a lot of you spotted that this is an algebraic fraction. You were correct. A lot of you were talking about factorizing. Again, you were correct. So let's talk about how we can factorize the top and the bottom of this fraction. We want to factorize it because that is going to allow us to cancel out any common factors. How can we, can, how can we factorize the top and the bottom? On the top, we have x to the power of 5 minus 4x cubed. We can see that both of these are going to have a common factor of x to the power of 3. That is the yeah, yeah, I can have a common power of x to the power of 3. So we're going to pull out a factor of x to the power of 3. What do you times by x to the power of 3 to get x to the power of 5? It's going to be x squared. That's because when we multiply two bases with the with powers, we add the powers. So we have x squared minus what do you times by x cubed to, to get um, 4x cubed? You times it by 4. So we have x cubed times by x squared minus 4 on the top. On the bottom, what do we have? Well, we can pull out a common factor of three because three goes into three X and six. So we pull out a three and we get, what do you times by three to get three X? You times it by X. What do you times by three to get minus six? You times it by minus two. So now we have a simplified fraction, but wait, we were looking for two common factors to divide the top and bottom by. We haven't found that. Oh no, we're panicking, we're panicking, we're panicking. What are we gonna do? we spot that we can actually simplify the top again. A lot of people are going to have missed this, but we can actually use the difference of two squares here to simplify this x squared minus 4 on the top. We can write x squared minus 4 using the difference of two squares as x plus 2 times by x minus 2. Difference of two squares because we have x squared here minus a square number here. And on the bottom, we're going to get x minus 2. Uh, 3, sorry, times x minus 2. Now we have a common factor on the top and the bottom of our fraction. So we can divide top and bottom both by x minus 2, and those are going to cancel out. On the top, we're going to be left with x cubed times by x plus 2. And on the bottom, we're just going to be left with 3. And this, guys, is going to give us our final answer to this question. We're going to have x cubed times by x plus 2 over three. What do we think? How was that? Some of you guys are going to be saying that we should expand this on the top. You can if you want to, you don't have to. 
Some of you are going to be saying that we can rearrange this in some way on the top. You can if you want to. You definitely don't have to. This is a perfect answer. You would get all the marks for this. Love Heart said it makes sense now. Great to hear. Great to hear. Somebody said, where did you get the times three from? Um, it was this times three here that we got from factorizing this. Man like Dimple said, I won a math debate. Come on. What, what kind of debate was that? That must have been a... <laughs> I don't know how you can have a math debate, but let me know in the comments. Let me know. Um, or in the chat, I should say, not comments. Um, can you factor one over three out the front? Um, if you mean, could you write it like this? One over three times X squared times X plus two. Yeah, you could also write it like that. You would also get the marks for that. You don't have to, um, but you could if you wanted to, it would still be correct. Okay, looking at the chat now, guys, any questions, let me know. Uh, Izzy said, uh, please go through the difference of two squares. Okay, we can do that. We can do that. Um, I'll do it at the end of the session, though, maybe. Maybe today, maybe uh, a different day. Depends on what time we finish. Um, okay. Let's have a look. Next question on the screen. Only a one marker. Somebody said, can you go over the first bit, please? I'm not going to have time now, but... Uh, yeah, uh, you can watch the recording. That's that's what I was going to say. Um, yeah, you can watch the recording. It's going to be uploaded to the channel um, at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So maybe that will uh, maybe that will help. OK, question 23. Let's have a look, guys. PQR is a straight line. The ratio of PQ to QR is three to one. And P to Q is equal to A. Circle the vector R to Q. Let me know in the chat, guys. What do you think? Karima says one over four A. It's going to trip a lot of people up. Uh, this has tripped a lot of people up. Our answer, guys, is going to be this one minus one over three A minus one over three A. Now, why is it going to be minus one over three A? Let's talk firstly about the negative and then about the one over three. Why is it negative? Well, the reason that it's negative is because we were told that P to Q in this direction was A. But then we were asked the vector R to Q going in this direction. A is moving to the right. So R to Q is moving to the left. So that's why the A is negative. Now, why is it one over three? We're told that the ratio of P to Q to Q to R is three to one. That means that when P to Q is 3, effectively, Q to R is 1. This is one third of this number here. So this would be effectively 3. This would be effectively 1. And this R to Q is one third of what P to Q would be. So this would be one quarter of the total distance, but it would be one third of the distance here. Hopefully that made sense, guys. Let me know in the Chat, somebody said that's easy. You should be on doing foundation if you don't get that. Absolutely not true. That is a difficult question. And a lot of people don't like vectors. So definitely not the case. Very few people would have got that right. Just to clear it up. Um, okay. Yeah, exactly, family. I'm exactly. Nicely done, Antonia. Did that make sense when I explained it, guys? If you have any more questions, Izzy said, I just don't get why it was negative, but I do now. Okay, perfect. Okay, no idea how it's a third. Let me go over it one more time. Basically, we were told that the ratio of this part here to this part here was three to one. So this section is worth three times as much as this section here. That's why it's a third. So this section is a third of what this section would be it is a quarter of what the overall distance would have been. That's why it's the case. It would be one quarter of the overall distance. It's one out of four parts overall. But compared to that PQ, it's a third of it. Okay, a couple of people are saying it makes sense now. Awesome. If it made sense that time around. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Famalam. You're talking about PQ. So here it says that PQ is A, not that PR is A. That, that little bit would have tripped a lot of people up as well. Okay, let's move on to the next ones, guys. Question 24. Let me just have a quick look. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Okay, yeah, we can finish this off. We're going to uh, we're gonna have to move pretty quickly. Um, 
But yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Okay, question 24. It says, here is a sketch of y equals f of x. The curve passes through these points. On the grid, sketch the curve y equals f of x plus 2. f of x plus 2. Looking at the chat now, guys, any questions, let me know. Ah, no worries, Sidemen, no worries. I know normally we finish at seven o'clock, so uh, maybe you were expecting to finish at seven, but hey, mate, it's been good to have you, uh, it's been good to have you up until this point. So uh, yeah, no worries at all, no worries at all. Hopefully it's been a good paper for you. Let me know in the comments. Ah, oh, chat, not, not comments. Okay, bunch of people are saying left two, bunch of people are saying right two, what's it gonna be? Let me just draw over this. Let's just pretend that that was a perfect drawing. And then we'll talk about where it moves. So when it comes to our graphical transformations, whenever we are going to move something by adding or subtracting something to the equation, it's always going to be to a function. So we're always going to have y equals f of x or g of x or h of x, any function, and then add or subtract a number to it. Now, what are we going to be moving or how are we going to be moving this curve here? Because we're adding the number directly to the x, that means we're going to be moving in the x direction. If it was y equals f of x plus 2, not directly to the x, then we would be moving in the y direction. But because it's directly to the x, we're moving in the x direction. The next thing to remember is going to be that if we're moving in the x direction, we have to do the opposite. We have to do the opposite. So because we're Adding 2 here, we're going to have to subtract 2 and move it 2 units to the left. When we're doing something to the x directly, we do the transformation in the x direction and we reverse the sign. Because this is a positive, we move to the left. If it was adding 2 to the end, instead we would be moving 2 units up and we would do the same. We would do the same as what you would expect. Because this is positive, we would move up. And if it was negative, we would move down. But if we do it directly to the x, then we have to reverse. Okay, Ethan says, oh, okay. Yeah, if it's in the, in the, yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. If it's in the brackets, you do it to the x and you do the opposite. If it's outside of the brackets, you do it in the y and you do the same. That's going to be the quickest way. Stepper said, nice, come on, nicely done, mate. I'm going to put question 25 on the screen for you now, guys. We have a big five marker. Very good revision, this question. Very good revision. Let's have a look at what we can do. And also, any questions, let me know. Nassim said, do you do the opposite still with the Y? No, you don't. You only do the opposite if, uh, if you're doing it in the X direction. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time to do this. And then I'm going to go through it. Okay, looking at the chat now, guys. Any questions, let me know. And drop ready in the chat when you are ready. This one, like I say, very good for revision. Very good for revision. Elma said, so Kartoa, and then sign rule, you are correct. You are correct. Karima's ready. Love Heart's ready. I know we're moving pretty fast on this one. I've not given you guys long for this. Ali said, when do you use the cosine rule and when do you use the sine rule? The best way to think about it is basically check if you can use the sine rule. Check if you can use the sine rule. If you can, then use it. And if you can't, use the cosine rule. How do you know if it's a sine rule? It's a sine rule whenever we're dealing with two pairs of opposites. Okay, guys, bunch of people are ready. Ellie's ready. Angela's ready. Let's talk about it. So the question gives us two triangles, ADC and ABC. And it asks us to find the size of X. We see that this triangle over here is a right angle triangle. Whenever we see a triangle like this, we're thinking, guys, we're going to be having to use either so, ka, or toa. So when it comes to using so, ka, toa to find a side length or an angle, we're going to have to firstly label our sides. Let me just talk quickly about how we know what we want to work out. 
We want to work out the size of x, but we're not given enough information in this triangle to calculate x. So we're going to firstly work out this side length here, because then we can use our sine rule to find the value of x when we have this side here. So that's why we work out this one. Let's label our side lengths. Opposite our angle, we have our opposite side. Opposite our right angle, we have our hypotenuse. And finally, our last one is going to be our adjacent. We look at the side lengths that we have. We have the adjacent, we look at the side length that we want, we want the opposite, so we know that we're going to be using TOA because that's the one that includes O and A. So let's write out what we know. We know that so called to TOA, or sorry, TOA tells us that tan of our angle is equal to our opposite side divided by our adjacent side. We can substitute in what we know and rearrange it to find our side. Tan of our angle, our angle here is 49, equals our opposite side length. We have our opposite, that's what we're trying to work out. Let's call it y for now, divided by our adjacent side, that is 16. This is now an equation which we can rearrange to find the value of y. At the moment, y is being divided by 16, so we can multiply both sides by 16. We get that y equals 16 times by tan 49, which is something that we can bing into our calculator. If we type that into our calculator, what do we get? 16 times by 1049, we get 18.406 to three decimal places. So we've now found that this side length here is 18.406. Now, where can we go from there? We look at this triangle here and we check what information we have and what information we're trying to work out. The first thing we notice is that this is not a right angle triangle, so we're thinking of our sine rule and our cosine rule. Where do we go from there? Is it going to be the sine rule? Is it going to be the cosine rule? Well, we check whether we can use the sine rule. We can use the sine rule if we're dealing with two pairs of opposites. We can see that we have 35 degrees and we're given 20 centimeters. They're in an opposite pair. We want the value of x and we have the value of the opposite side, 18.46. So again, they're in opposites. That tells us that we can use our sine rule. Now, when it comes to using our sine rule, what do we have in our formula box? We're told the sine rule is A over sine A equals B over sine B. Now, this is one version of the sine rule, and we can absolutely use it to find x if we want to. But we're actually going to use a slightly different version of the sine rule. The reason that we're going to use the other one is because we want our angles, our uppercase letters, to be on the top. That is going to make it a little bit easier to rearrange. What's this other version of the sine rule? Well, we can just flip the top and the bottom of each of our fractions. So we can write it as sine A over A equals sine B over B. What does our sine rule tell us? Well, it tells us that sine of one of our angles divided by the opposite side length is equal to sine of the other angle divided by the opposite side length. We can substitute these values in and rearrange to find what we want. So we can call our angle that we want x. So we have sine x over the opposite side length, 18.406 equals sine of b, our other angle, sine 35 over our side length, which is opposite of 20. Now, some of you are going to be thinking, but wait, what about the fact that you've changed the A's with the B's and all that stuff? It doesn't matter which ones are your A's and your B's, as long as you keep them in pairs of opposites, as long as you do the opposite angle divided by the opposite side, X is opposite 18.406, and the opposite angle, 35 degrees, is opposite 20. This is now an equation which we can rearrange to find the value of X. Firstly, what's preventing the x from being on its own is being divided by 18.406. So we're going to multiply both sides by 18.406. We get sine of x equals 18.406 times by sine 35 over 20. Now, we have two choices. We could type this into our calculator if we wanted to and simplify the right-hand side. I know most people will have probably done that, so I'll do that now. We're going to do 18.406 times by a fraction. We have sine 35 over 20. Typing that into our calculator, we get 0 0.52786, etc. We know that sine of x is equal to that. Now, how do we find the value of x? Given that sine x equals this, well, we need to 
cancel off this sign. We need to do the opposite to the sign to get the x on its own. So we're going to do sine to the minus one of both sides. We get x equals sine to the minus one of 0 0.52786, etc. Which, if we type into our calculator, gives us our answer of 31.86 degrees. Okay, talk to me, guys. Talk to me. Did we get that? Famalam Kurz got it, said 31.8. Stapper got it. Nicely done. Guys, that took a long time to explain. I felt like I was speaking for ages and I felt like I was speaking for ages. But hopefully that description made sense. Hopefully that description made sense. It's one of those topics which when you know how to do it isn't too bad. But when you're talking through it, it takes a long time. Um, so uh, let me know. Uh, let me know in the comments. Did, I, did that make sense? Okay, we have a thumbs up from headphones. In general, we're quite liking it. Guys, if you're liking this question, that's a very good sign. It's quite a high level question. It's a five marker. So uh, yeah, nicely done if you got it. Nicely done if you got it. Question 26 and 27 on the screen. And then we're on to our last question of the day. Question 28. Let's have a look. 26 and 27. What can we do? Famalam Kurz, I know you're a liker of the functions. Let's see who else is in the chat. Uh, Marina, it seems like you're going. It's been great having you today. I think you're new, right? I don't think I've seen you before on the chat. So uh, welcome to the community. It's been good having you today. I see Bellingham still in here liking. Love to see it, mate. Love to see it. Hope this paper's going well for you. Nassim said, make me moderator. I do have student moderators, but if you want to become a moderator, that is not how you do it. <laughs> um, let's have a look. Any questions, guys? Let me know. Looking at the chat now. Ah, okay. Marina said, I've been here before, but not for long. Fair play, fair play. I'll be on here for all week when you do AQA. Ah, okay, nice. I think the next AQA higher paper is in four days or so, off the top of my head. Um, let's have a look. Hello, Frankie B. V said, this is my second time. Come on, that is the start of uh, start of something special by the sounds of it. Um, let's have a look. Question 26. It says f of x equals x over x plus 2. g of x equals x squared minus 2. It then says, work out f of g of x. Give your answer in the form a plus bx to the power of n, where a, b, and n are integers. This is a fairly standard functions question, but it does ask us to give it in a weird form. Let's see what we can do. Finding f of g of x, how are we going to do it? We're going to plug g of x into f of x. We're going to take our function g of x, x squared minus 2, put it into f of x. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we're going to swap all of our x's in f of x for x squared minus 2. And we put g into f because g is closer to x down here. So what are we going to do? We're going to have f of g of x equals swapping our x for x squared minus 2. We have x squared minus 2 over x plus 2. We're going to have swapping x for x squared minus 2. We have x squared minus 2 plus 2 which when we simplify gives us on the top x squared minus 2 over then we have x squared minus 2 plus 2. These two cancel out and we just have x squared. Now, where can we go from there? It says, write your answer in the form a plus bx to the power of n. What we're going to do is we're going to split this up into two different numbers. We have x squared over x squared minus 2 over x squared. That's because on the top we have x squared minus 2. We can break this down into two separate fractions. x squared over x squared, any number divided by itself is 1, so this is just 1. And then we have minus 2 times by. Now, how can we write 2 over x squared in the form bx to the power of n? Well, we know, or we might know, that when we have a negative power, it makes it 1 over. So 2 over x squared is the same as 2 times by x to the power of negative 2. The squared is from here, and the negative is because it's 1 over. This gives us our answer then, guys, of 1 minus 2x to the power of negative 2. Now, some of you are going to be thinking, yeah, but it says plus bx. In reality, when it says something like that plus bx, it can be plus or minus because 
This is just like adding minus two. This is just like adding minus two. So guys, that is going to be how we do that one. Um, Patrick Redmond said, not too bad. Is this a common question? Yeah, quite a common question. Quite difficult though. This part I would say is common, but this part here is quite tricky. Um, this part here is quite tricky. Yeah, ADZ said, I never would have thought to do it like that. Yep, you wouldn't have until you saw this. Now that you've seen this, hopefully um, your kind of skills are, are higher and you, you'll be able to spot it next time. Okay, question 27. This one is another problem solving question. Quite a tricky one again, I would say. Let's have a look. A couple of people are saying, can you do it again? Um, I might do it again at the end of the session. I might do it again at the end of the session. I just need to see what time we finish. I know that a lot of people are going to be wanting me to keep going through. So uh, I'm not going to do it again right now, but, but I can do it again at the end. Okay, guys, tricky question 27. It says the point three, one over 64, lies on the curve y equals k to the power of x, where k is a constant. Show that the point a half, a half also lies on the curve. How are we going to do it? How are we going to do it, guys? What do we think? It's going to involve substitution. Let me say that much. And you know the drill, let me know. Drop ready in the chat when you're ready. This is a tricky question. This is a tricky question. It requires a high level understanding of uh, of graphs. But yep, it does involve substitution. But to anybody who's thinking, wow, I have no idea what's going on here. Don't panic. Don't let that make you panic. Um, this is a tricky question. Tricky question. Okay, a couple of people are ready. <laughs> Hissy says in, uh, in a very clear way, yep, not today, or yeah, nah. <laughs> um, so what are we going to do? What we're going to do, guys, is we're going to use the point that they give us to work out the value of k. We know that when x equals 3, y is equal to 1 over 64. We can plug those values into our equation to find the value of k. Once we have that, we can see whether the point a half a half also satisfies that equation. So we know that when y is 1 over 64, so we have 1 over 64 equals k to the power of x, x is 3. So we have 1 over 64 equals k to the power of 3. We've substituted in x equals 3 and y equals 1 over 64. This is an equation which we can solve to find the value of k. At the moment, k is being cubed, so we're going to do the square, sorry, we're going to do the cubed root of both sides. So we have k equals the cubed root of 1 over 64. This is something that you can plug into your calculator. If you did, guys, you would get 1 over 4 because 4 times 4 is 16, and 16 times 4 is 64. You could just do that on your calculator, though. So now we know that k is equal to 1 over 4. We can plug this into our original equation then. So we know that the equation is y equals 1 over 4 to the power of x. Now, how can we show that this point lies on the curve? We need to show that when x is a half, y is in fact a half. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in x equals a half and check the value of y. We're going to get y equals 1 over 4 to the power of a half. The power of a half, what does that mean? When we have a power of a half, that's the same as the square root. So we have y equals the square root of 1 over 4. What's the square root of 1 over 4? What do you times by itself to get 1 over 4? You times a half by itself to get 1 over 4. Now, you could do this with your calculator. 1 over 4 to the power of a half is just a half, but I wanted to show you the working out just to show the logic behind that. Like I say, tricky question, guys, tricky question. Any questions, let me know in the chat. Otherwise, we're going to move on to our last question of the day, question 28. Let's have a look. What do we think to that one? Yeah, Gecko, no worries. To be honest, this was a very tricky question, a very specific question. Some people are saying it makes a bit of sense. That's really good if it does. This is a very specific question and a very tricky question. So uh, if, if it still doesn't make too much sense, don't let that panic you. Don't let it stress you out. Um, but if it does make sense now, absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome.
Okay, next question is going to be on the screen. We have question 28, and there are two parts to this. So let me put both of the parts on the screen. I'll give you guys a bit of time to figure it out, and then I'll go through all of it at once. I'll go through all of it at once. We have a two marker, and we have a four marker. Questions are on the screen, and I'm looking at the chat now. And yeah, this one, guys, is, is pretty tricky. This one, guys, is pretty tricky. Somebody saying, is this AQA? Yep, yeah, this is an AQA paper two from November 2018. Milko says, bro, why can't they just put the maths and not tons of words? Yep, I understand that feeling a lot. I understand that feeling a lot. And I know a lot of people are thinking that. I know a lot of people are thinking that. Uzair said, do you have to work out the area under the line for the second part? Yes, you do. That's going to be part of it. Okay, guys, let me know when you're ready for me to talk through 28A. And then once we are done with 28, we have finished this past paper and we can have our little party. <laughs> Izzy said, bye. What is this? Fair play. Uh, Unicorn's ready. Love Heart's ready. ADZ is ready. Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, he says, yeah, please start this. This one's overwhelming. Yeah. A lot of people are feeling that way, I know. Okay, let's have a look. It says Izzy runs an 80 meter race in 14 seconds. During the first six seconds, her speed increases at a constant rate. During the last eight seconds, her speed increases at a different constant rate. Her speed at 14 seconds is two meters per second more than her speed at six seconds. So her speed at 14 seconds is two meters per second more than her speed at six seconds. Here is a sketch of her speed time graph, and I've just drawn on a little bit inf of information to include that final bullet point. It says work out her acceleration during the last eight seconds. State the units of your answer. Now, how are we going to do this? How can we work out the acceleration when we're given this speed time graph? Well, our acceleration is our rate of change of speed. So to work out the acceleration during the last eight seconds, we're going to have to do the change in speed divided by the time it took. We're told that between second six and 14, her speed increased by two meters per second. So we know the change in speed is two. And how long did that take? That took from six to 14. 14 subtract six is eight seconds. So what's our acceleration going to be? It's going to be our change in y, our change in speed, divided by our change in x, our change in time. It's going to be two over eight. Two over eight, which we could simplify if we wanted to, to one over four. That, guys, is going to be our answer. But it does ask us for the units of our answer. Our units of acceleration, what are they going to be? Our speed is in meters per second. Our time is in seconds. So we're going to be in meters per second squared. Meters per second squared. You could write ms to the minus two. You could write m over s squared. Both of those are going to be okay. That is our unit for acceleration. Hey, Izzy said it wasn't actually too bad. Nice to see. Great, Marcel. Yep, that is exactly right for the units. Yep, meters per second squared. Good job. Famalam said per second per second. That is also true. If you wrote meters per second per second, you would get all the marks. That would be perfect. That would be perfect. Angela says it would be a... F or. It looks like a physics question. Um, yeah, you could get asked this in a physics exam, to be honest. I think this is a bit hard for a physics exam um, because it's a bit kind of too mathsy. Or no, no, you could definitely get asked that. You could definitely get asked that. A said, it makes sense now. Love to see it. N said, why did you write to the power of negative two? This is just a different way of writing this. You know, like if you have a negative power, it makes it one over. So that's like one over S squared. So two different ways of writing the same thing. Ethan said, if you didn't write the units, would you lose marks? Yes, you would. They say state the units of your answer, so you'd lose one mark if you didn't. Guys, let's talk about 28B. I'm going to draw a couple of things on this line, or on this graph, I should say, and let's see if it helps. I'm going to draw on that this is, let's call it um, X, and this is also X. 
That's what I'm going to draw on. And let's see if that helps us. Let me know in the chat, actually, would you like me to just go through this? Would you like me to just go through the final answer? Or would you like a little bit of time to work it out? It says when Izzy finishes the 80 meter race, her speed is V, work out the value of V. What are we saying? Go through it now or give you guys a bit of time. Okay, Izzy says go through it. I am Bob says go through it. Headphone says now, please. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. Last question of the day. Let's see what we can do. This one's tricky. Let's have a look. It says when Izzy finishes the 80 meter race, her speed is V meters per second. Work out the value of V. We even want to work out how effectively tall this is when she finishes. How are we going to do that? Well, we're told that it's an 80 meter race. So we're given the information and they hide it in the question that the total distance traveled is 80 meters. So we can say that something equals 80 meters. How can we work out the total distance traveled? Well, that's going to be our area under our speed time graph. To work out the distance traveled, we can do the area under our speed time graph. So let's work out the area. We have this box here. This is a triangle with a base of six. It goes from zero to six and a height of X. We can use a half times by base times by height. We have a half times by the base, which is six times by the height, which is X equals. Oh, oh, that's going to be dodgy, isn't it? Whatever. So we have the area of this here, which is a half times by base times by height. We've written on the height of X. Then we're going to add to that the area of this um, trapezium here. We can think about this as a trapezium with a top length of X, a bottom length of X plus two and a vertical height of eight. We could also think about this as a square plus a triangle. Either way is fine. We're going to use the trapezium. How would we work out the area of this trapezium? Given to you guys in the formula book, we know that the area of a trapezium is equal to a half times by A plus B times by H, where A and B are the top and the bottom length of the trapezium, and H is the height of the trapezium. So we can do a half times six times X plus a half times by, our top length is going to be X. We know that our bottom length is two more than that, so it's going to be X plus two. So we have X plus X plus two, and we're going to times that by our height. The height of this trapezium here is going to be the difference between six and 14, which is going to be eight. So we know the area of the first triangle plus the area of the trapezium is equal to 80. This is now an equation which we can solve to find the value of x. Let's do it. A half times by 6 is 3 times by x is 3x plus a half times by 2x plus 2 times 8. Okay, I didn't say that in the best way. Let's simplify this firstly. We can write this x plus x plus 2 as 2x plus 2. A half times by 8 is 4. So we have four times by two X plus two equals 80. We can now expand these brackets, three X plus eight X plus eight equals 80. We can now bring together our, uh, sorry, collect our like terms. We have three X plus eight X is 11 X plus eight equals 80. We can take eight from both sides 11x equals 72. And now we can divide both sides by 11. We get x equals 72 over 11. Guys, where do we go from there? We now have the value of x. What did x represent? x represented this length here. But we want v, which is the velocity at the end. The velocity at the end is going to be this x here plus this 2 here. So we're going to do 72 over 11 plus our two. Guys, if we do that, type it into our calculator. What are we going to get? 72 over 11 plus two. We get our final answer of 94 over 11 as the value of V. Guys, let me know in the chat. Did anybody get that? 94 over 11, 8.55 to two decimal places. Let me know. Talk to me. Did we get that? That one was brutal, right? Yeah, Milk Drinker said I'm dead. Yep, that was the final question of the paper, and it was not a nice one. Uh, Izzy said, are you joking? 
Uh, that was not as bad as I was expecting. Ah, come on. Come on. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> AMT said, so even I found that tricky. Yep. And AMT is a math teacher. Yeah, that was not an easy question, guys. But hopefully it made sense when I went through it. I was struggling a little bit for room down here. So the uh, the writing isn't as clear as it could be. But you are right. That is a tricky question. To anybody wanting me to explain it again, um, I'm not going to have time to do that. However, this will be uploaded to the channel tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. So you can watch it back there if you would like to. Guys, we have now finished this paper. We are at the end of the questions. That was the question we just did. So... It is time for the celebrations, guys. You have done a fantastic job this evening. Let's drop those party emojis in the chat. You know the drill by now. To anybody, yeah, Bellingham's partying. Come on. You guys beat me to it before I even said it. ADZ is partying. ADZ, you've put in some good work today, mate. You've put in some good work today. I know there's been some tricky questions in there, but uh, yeah, good work, mate. I am Bam Bob putting the flame emojis in the chat. Come on. Very bored said, is this the longest live you have done? It's actually not. Day before paper one, I went live for three and a half hours, which was kind of mad. That was kind of mad. I'll probably do the same paper two and three, um, but that was kind of mad. Ethan's partying. Ellie is partying. Come on. Love to see it. Beatrice is partying. Says going now. Hey, great job this evening, Beatrice. Um, it's been nice having you. I've not noticed you in the chat before. So uh, welcome to the group. Welcome to the community. If uh, if this is your first time, V, you are very welcome. Um, a lot of people partying today. Angela's partying. N is partying. Step and no worries. Izzy, no worries. My pleasure. By the way, Angela, let me know in the chat. Do you pronounce your name Angela or Ankala? I have a friend like who's Spanish and she's called Ankala. So I, I keep switching between Ankala and Angela. So let me know so I don't keep messing it up if I'm getting it wrong. Hey, Gecko, my pleasure. Good job this evening. Good job this evening. Nice. You've started to become a regular. It's, uh, it's nice to see. It's nice to see. Um, Bruh is partying. Ties is partying. Hamzad is happy. Come on. Um, hey, Beanie, you're welcome. You're welcome. Ellie's partying. Hey, guys, awesome job this evening. Awesome job this evening. Uh, so it's Angela. Nice, nice. I'll say Angela. Huey's partying. Family, I'm still partying. Come on. Um, N said time for a long nap. Yes, guys, it is now half past seven. You've put in a fantastic shift today. I know some of you probably go to bed crazy late and revise into the evening. But for most of you, it will be time to put your feet up, relax and be happy about the fact that you've just patterned another full pass paper. You're going to be making ridiculous progress. Um, so, uh, yeah, well done, guys. Well done. Um, Ayub says, when's your next lesson? Mate, we are live every day, 5 p.m. till 7 p.m. until the end of GCSE maths, until the end of GCSE maths. So, uh, yeah, we switched between edXL and AQA. Today was AQA. Tomorrow's going to be edXL. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we uh, we switched between them. Very bored. Said I napped for three hours earlier. Okay, that's not a nap. That's not a nap. I'm classing that as a sleep. Um, so, I... I can't now because I feel guilty. Yeah, man, I know that feeling. You guys are going to have some mixed emotions. Um, there's going to be some weird things going on inside your minds. You might be thinking, I know a lot of you might be having that feeling of like any time spent not revising. You feel a bit guilty, right? Um, that's a very natural feeling, very natural feeling. You've got to ride the wave. And let me tell you, it's definitely not the case. You need a bit of balance. Of course, you want to do your revision, um, but you can't revise all day. Make sure you're doing the important things. Make sure you're seeing your friends. Make sure you're speaking to your family. Make sure you're exercising. Make sure you're uh, getting some good sleep. It's important to keep balance, even at times of big revision. Ah, uh, Thank you, Izzy. That's very nice. That's very nice. Um, Cheyenne Ali said, how many hours should I revise every day? It's going to be different for everybody, but I would say any more than four hours is probably being very unproductive. And that doesn't mean that you have to revise four hours every day. Obviously, that's like an upper limit. If you're doing one hour of good quality revision every day, hey, that's still going to be moving you in the right direction. So I would say do as much as you can, but don't stress out too much about not spending all your time at the desk. That is not what it's about. It's about putting in good quality hours when the time comes. Um, hey, that's good to hear, Ren. That's good to hear. I know we're going to be making some big progress. I know we're going to be making some big progress. Um, Izzy said, so when is the next AQA hire? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I want to say it's going to be in three or four days. If you check the, uh, if you check the IG, which I made a few days ago, there's a post there, which highlights the different, um, the different 
exam boards and tiers and stuff we're doing on each of the days. So I don't know off the top of my head, but it will say it over there. It will say it over there. Okay, guys, any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day there. <laughs> ADZ, touche. All I can say is touche. Actually, guys, yeah, let me know quickly now. Is there anything at all we can do to improve these lives? Is the time good? Is five till seven the best time? I think five till seven is a pretty good time. Um, do you want me to go quicker, slower? Let me know if there's any improvements. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, yeah, we'll call it a day. ADZ, yeah, that was a good comment. One cheeky, one cheeky improvement is a GCSE stats live before paper one. Hey, let me think about that and I'll let you know. Let me think about that and I'll let you know. Um, Hamlam said, yeah, about the stats, lol. Um, yeah, let me think about that. Five till seven is a good time. Okay. And said everything good and good pace. Nice. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, Bronnie said, could you go a bit slow when you're explaining the hard questions? Yeah, I can definitely do that. I can definitely do that. Um, if, if there's any particular ones that you're thinking about, um, all of the recordings are on, uh, on YouTube. So that could also help you out, but yeah, yeah. And also make sure if you have any questions throughout that you're asking me so I can, uh, so I can do my best to answer them. Okay. The chat seems to have dried up guys. So I'll say goodbye again. Give yourselves a big pat on the back because, uh, that's another big shift put in from 5 PM till 7 PM another pass paper in the locker and you guys are going to be making some serious progress. So uh, yeah, well done. And uh, I'll catch as many of you as possible tomorrow night. Otherwise it will be in a few days to everybody saying bye in the chat. Bye to you all. Um, and uh, yeah, see you next time. Adios guys.